Okay, guys, here we go. Okay. Very few TIs have any um, inkling as to what's going on, technologically speaking, let alone how to register it and record it, intercept it, and measure it. And as far as um, you know, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency goes, they have all the keys, they have all of the technology, and anybody out there who knows about it, as far as having worked for them goes, will, will die under mysterious circumstances shortly thereafter, having released any information in regards to it. You follow? Absolutely. I mean, we're looking at that. We've we've done a bit of that ourselves, to be honest with you. We we we've done you know, from for my personal perspective into this issue is that it's it's ultimately run by an artificial intelligence exactly. mainframe which interfaces with the human consciousness on a variety of different levels, which right. sets algorithms that it can pick up off of our behavior and then set to modify them in our social structure, even all the way to legislation. I mean, you're essentially talking about a type of computer and which has, you know, in a sense found a way to control large or at least steer large portions of the populace by seating itself in, in, in high places, so to speak. And yeah, I, it's a real problem. I mean, there's no way that we I can see all these brain signals being interpreted by anything other than an AI, and then what it does is, is it compensates for it. And you're right. These guys, you know, the guy who oversees artificial intelligence for the National Security Agency is a man named Randy Garrett, um, and he, he seems to be uncovered in some of the other documents that we have Certainly, everything points to him. He also is the current project manager for DARPA, and so when we tie those things in, along with the rest of the information in our own lives, it really becomes a clear picture of some of the things that are going on here. So, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. I, you know, the floor is yours, as far as I'm concerned. I just kind of want to get my two uh -huh. cents in, but well, thank you for that. Um, I have done some work in the past for uh, DARPA and NASA, as far as technology goes. And that was all before I was a TI. And then shortly thereafter I became a TI, everything just totally went crazy. And everything went downhill, lost my job, lost my house, lost, um, I ended up getting divorced. And it was just absolutely crazy. And now I'm endeavoring to, um, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt scientifically that this is what's happening, knowing how it's done. And once I acquire all the data that I need, I'm going to give it free for all. Everybody on Facebook, everybody on Twitter, everybody on YouTube, everybody. <laughs> I'd say you fit in around here pretty good because that's our style exactly. This kind of information is for everybody. And when yep. we see this kind of stuff going on, you know, are you, are you able to talk about the stuff that you did with NASA and for DARPA? Um, it wouldn't be good if I did. <laughs> Okay, I, I can understand that. Let's just say that it um, it involves radio frequency. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate any more about what I did other than that. In other words, I have... With a lot of researchers in the field, there's always some type of conflict, and largely it seems that there are programs to keep people from, from tearing down the compartmentalization that exists within this program that exactly. just a few people at the back have all the, you know, they're pulling the strings and they compartmentalize this stuff out. And so uncovering that aspect sounds like that's kind of what you're focusing on too, huh? Yes, but I'm, I'm a lone gunman here. I'm doing everything that I can possibly do all on my own with my own resources and, and zero help. And, and, and in fact, the, the help is so scarce in my life that, you know, if I was to tell my friends exactly what it is I'm doing and why I'm doing it, they would think I'm crazier than they think I am. So, I would argue that that's a symptom of this blanketing of the mind control on the public. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I mean, I, I can see it in people's eyes. I, I can see it in people's eyes when they're just, you know, they're there. And the lights are on, but nobody's home, so to speak. And I. So how do we how do we put these guys out of that? I mean, it sounds like you're really trying to take a step into action of how you plan to interpret these signals and stuff. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and tell us how that, how that works? Sure. Voice-to-scroll technology it in, involves resume, resonation of the um, of bone tissue in, in the cranium. See, bone is piezoelectric. That means that it is 
a crystalline material that when a pressure is applied to it, it produces electricity. And piezoelectricity works in both ways. You apply pressure, electricity is produced. You apply electricity, pressure is produced. In the case of voice-to-skull technology, electricity, i.e. electromagnetism, is produced and it bombards the, um, the, the cranial tissue. And from there, the piezoelectric properties of the cranial tissue produces a vibration. And that vibration is then coupled into the uh, cochlear nerve and then you interpret that as audio. It's, um, it's not as um, complicated. And that's the, distinction between, that's the distinction between voice to skull and something like synthetic telepathy, where in essence, the human skeletal system acts like an antenna at that point, isn't that kind of? Exactly. The um, synthetic okay. telepathy is a little bit more um, advanced. It has to do with uh, a phenomenon called bioencoding. In other words, if you have, say, a whole crowd of people and you're shining this um, modulated electromagnetic beam at them, and you bioencode this electromagnetic beam to a specific target based on their DNA, then only that target would hear it. Nobody else would. Yeah, I can back that up. I mean, to really, you know, we've talked about this on other shows that, that everything you just said, I can independently confirm, and I know other people who can as well. And so putting that together is very important, but well, we're talking about a type of weaponry which can target somebody specifically with their own resonance signature on the genetic level at this point. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, this is a major issue in human rights and for things to come in the future. The abuse of these types of devices is such a pivotal issue in our in our culture right now. Just in a, you know, not just here in America, but internationally. And you know, what's so fascinating to me is to unlock these secrets with the piezochromatism and the, um, and the piezoelectricity here. You know, right. when you have these types of particles that interact this way, we know that the function of the pineal gland also acts this way. And it's very interesting to see how there's an artificial methodology which seeks to somehow mimic that in our bodies through the use of these piezoelectric crystals and other properties that, that are coming through the just frequency alone. Because what we know is on the nano level, they're right. using these nanoparticulates which get into our bodies, which are piezoelectric, piezochromic, and so then we in turn act with, uh, interact with this electromagnetic energy. We've got a real problem on our hands here, and to be able to read this going on, whether it's on an individual basis, because what we see is this thing can compensate for an individual, but it's doing it to a collective mass of people, ultimately, is what we're looking at here. We're surrounded by this type of technology today. And exactly. I just... You know, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's extremely huge. And I believe the reason why I've been targeted is because of my, um, my in-depth knowledge and specializations, my, my skills, more or less, in the sciences, especially in electronics and chemistry. So I have um, in-depth knowledge as far as any of all of that stuff goes. I mean, I've um, spoken with professors. Do you ever consider what keeps them from just taking you out, period? I mean, you, know, you mentioned these guys will, you know, end up dead under mysterious circumstances with this type of knowledge. I mean, what keeps people like ourselves um, out of that category from your perspective? I mean, what's the goal of these guys? Are they just trying to soft kill you? or uh, soft, they, soft kill is one of their goals. But the, uh, the main goal is character assassination. You see, my character has already been assassinated. I've been, I've been labeled a paranoid schizophrenic, 5150, and the whole nine yards by the medical establishment. And I believe that is the only thing saving my life. Because, in other words, who's going to believe a crazy guy? Well, the an important thing that you can do is to try to hide out in the open. And that's the way that I try to look at it. I have taken some serious risks. I have the rest of my crew because of the caliber of the things that we talk about and the sources that we deal with. Um, and so it's a concern that we have to have, but the bottom line is these it's becoming, it seems to be getting out of control of people, and there's certainly still good people within these intelligence organizations and other factions which seem to be trying to do what's right, um, certainly not on all levels. Certainly there's clearly an agenda there to basically kill us all, but... Um, the white hat operatives, the white hat operatives are severely outnumbered. Yeah. Yeah, and you get into putting names on these things, and you know, 
who hasn't been infiltrated. It's just, you know, you have to kind of do what's right in the moment um, and yeah, see who's hiding uh, kind on of a thing out here because you never know who's who out here anymore. It's, it's hard to even know who to trust. But in regards to the reading of this technology, how do you prove your case? Even then, that was, that's, that's the, uh, the next issue that um, I still have yet to uh, figure out because, you know, anybody could say, oh, that's just a recording of uh, you messing around with a, um, you know, with a tape recorder and some, you know, voice alteration software or something. The only way I could prove it is to actually have it happen to me in real time. And I know exactly how to trigger that event. This um, artificial How do you trigger that event? Um, it sounds highly controversial. It sounds highly unlikely. It sounds absolutely ludicrous, but trust me, it's the real deal. Here we go. You ready? Absolutely. I would have to ingest methamphetamine. Yeah, and this is what I was talking. This is like, I knew you were going in this direction, um, and here's the deal. From my perspective, real quickly, not to cut you off, I just want to touch on this because I, it's so important. Because right. what, at that point, you're seeing a, a system trying to compensate and interact based on the brainwave pattern in a human organism that has changed and has, I did this, this artificial intelligence system has identified that change and begun to interface in order to somehow exploit that change or alter that change in the yeah. process of the interface. And so how, how do you feel about that? Um, I feel comfortable with doing that. I mean, the um, artificial intelligence protocols that are in place, I, I figured that out on my own that it is artificial intelligence because phrases are used, the same voice, the same inflections, as if it's an MP3 recording in some, you know, you know, some, you know, some folder filed away. And these MP3s are thus played according to a given scenario and or thought process. I figured that out on my own. So what do you say here? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you have to get into the matrix, so to speak, in order to, to figure these things out and maybe to go under this type of even a psychoactive experience here. I mean, you know, we're being blanketed with so many other drugs. Anyway, I could understand how people go this route. Um, yeah. Um, you know, well, what does that say about this system? Why are why is this system only come into focus when under the the the, the use of some type of, of of an amphetamine or some people it might be cocaine or different drugs that are altering uh, altering the consciousness stream of an individual? What are we seeing there? How does how does that come into play? Okay, my my take on that whole thing is this: people that ingest drugs of any kind for any reason under any circumstances as far as the majority of society is concerned they're lower life forms less than human therefore they see that as justification for incarceration experimentation etc oh, you're saying that the system views them as less than human and therefore you know the, the means to you know they're able to be experimented on because of that Correct. Just okay. like MK, just like MK Ultra did with um, you know prisoners and 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 um, transients and so forth, they are regarded as you know lower life forms. So therefore, uh, you know, they were fair game, and that's exactly what's what's going on. I mean, you you see all over the place people that you know so-called tweakers going out and you know doing you know crazy things, acting uncontrollably, unpredictably, and all of that. And what nobody I know has ever figured out is the fact that the reason why that's happening a lot more so now is, is because they're being targeted. But also, on top of that, everybody is chipped all the time. So are we seeing, and are we seeing a targeting, and certainly there are examples of somebody doing some type of an electronic harassment, whether it's through the microwave in the home or all these other types of ways in which they can set this stuff up now. They'll have a remote location up the street or across the street in a van or in their apartment, whatever, maybe they're above you. Are we seeing what seem like individual attacks that are ultimately generated from AI that's compensating for our many different people on a variety of different levels all in real time? Is that possible? Yes. 
that is possible. But there's, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware of, there are two specific modes of delivery for this electronic harassment. One is satellites, and I believe that they're um, not the geosynchronous satellites, but more of the orbital satellites, because I believe I have um, figured out a time window for which this um, voice of the skull attack occurs. You see the satellites that are um, not geosynchronous ones. You see the geosynchronous satellites are only about 20 miles to 50 miles up. The ones that are orbital are about 200, 400 miles up. Those ones travel and make one complete revolution around our planet every 90 minutes. I've noticed that these um, voice to skull attacks, they fade in and then fade out roughly every 90 minutes. So, hmm, I think that. that's very interesting. I think that that's a, you might really be onto something there. I'd like to talk with more people about that and see if we can't try to wrangle up some data in that area. I think that that's a that's a good call for you. Yeah. And then on top of that, I um, have experienced electronic harassment in my own home. That um, it sounds like a, you know, a, a printer carriage or um, some kind of hydraulic servo mechanism. Um, you know, moving back and forth, actuating, going burp, 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 coming from behind the wall. What that is are DARPA drones. They're about the size of, you know, the, the small, um, you know, about the size of a shoebox or whatever, and they're, and they're aerial. And they would um, discreetly the, the land on your house at night, you know, and plant a, uh, a small surveillance device into your home and then fly off. I've experienced that more than once. Yeah, I certainly believe it. We we have the papers where it talks about uh, they're official. I think they're Air Force or they're the Air Force or Navy. It might uh, might be a solicit. It's opening Pandora's box or Pandora's open. Or Pandora's box open wide. It's DoD stuff, and you know it talks about yeah, having it, a a GHZ genetic weapon on a UAV is the whole kind of thesis of this work. You know, it's unbelievable that. You know, the public is kept in the dark about this stuff, which is fascinating. I mean, it's not, it's disgusting, really, how we could it, it have is, uh, this stuff and, they, you know, what's being done I, about this. I've been heavy into the sciences for as long as I can remember. I mean, let's put it this way. I, I've, I think I've been programmed or something with some kind of, um, some, some kind of database or something when I was a very young child. Um, give you an example of this, why I believe this. When I was just a toddler, about maybe two years old, and this is a vivid memory for me. This is one of my first memories. I was about maybe two years old. And the, you know those little Polaroid um, disposable photo flash cubes, you know, the little flash bulbs for four, four lamps in a cube that are disposable? For some reason, I already knew exactly how to make it flash just by using a battery. It was a, a, size, a size C battery and a piece of wire that I stripped with my teeth. You know, it was even it was twenty. It was like twenty gauge black wire, about a three inch segment that I stripped with my teeth, and using that battery, that Polaroid flash cube, and my babysitter and my mother was there at the time, and I, I put the stuff together. I just intuitively already knew exactly how to do this. I did it, and everybody freaked out. They're like, "Oh my God, Reggie, what are you doing?" But. Um, yeah, it's, it's, science and technology is something that I just intuitively have a deep, intimate awareness of, always have. And using that knowledge that I've always had, I've been able to extrapolate and postulate you know, theories and ideas as to um, what can be done, both evil and good, with technology. And there's so many things out there being done that are evil with it, and I'm going, oh my gosh, I think I know exactly how that's being done. And so what I'm doing now is attempting to prove my theory and then give my data to the world. So, I mean, how, how are we going to expound upon that here? I mean, are, are there devices? I mean, what's the methodology here in which you plan to identify these attacks? Well, the first methodology would be to have a piezoelectric transducer that I would bite on into my teeth. Then that would feed into a electroencephalographic amplifier. I have a, a um, circuit board that is exactly that. It's actually an electromyographic amplifier, EMG. It, it, um, 
it works with um, muscle movement. You um, put the, um, the probes onto your um, skin, right? And then you, you squeeze or move a muscle, and it, you know, it creates a, a logic pulse, all depending on which muscle you contract. But that seems that would be an excellent choice, being that we know from these types of attacks that there is muscle twitching and movement and spasms and such. Yes, those are electronically induced. Exactly, but yeah. The, the, the receiver portion of that electronic harassment is already embedded in everybody. Everybody's already been assimilated like the Borg in Star Trek because the technology that enables this to occur is being breathed in. Chemtrails are spraying this stuff out. And chemtrails have about, I, I, I can think off the top of my head, about 10 different functions. But one of the functions is deployment of nanocytes. I call them nanocytes. And these nanocytes are very, very tiny fibers that you breathe in. And once you breathe them in, they get into your lungs, and they settle into your alveolar tissue. And within 20 minutes, they become systemic. And they get carried into the bloodstream. And they have an affinity for nervous tissue. What ends up happening is these nanocytes latch onto the nervous tissue and assemble themselves into receiving telemetry antennas. But everybody has been already um, tagged with this stuff. And once it becomes systemic, that is, it, it's, it's there for life. I, I'm aware of several different methods to where you, in, you introduce a chemical substance into the body, and all depending on what kind of chemical it is, whether it's you know something having to do with uh, medicine or assassination, what have you, there's a, um, a protein binding affinity factor that you have to take into account and a um, receptor site uh, structure that you have to take into account. What the body normally does is reject and reuptake the, um, those um, molecular keys, if you will. I call them molecular keys because you know, think of a key in a lock. Only one key will fit in there, or a similar shape key will fit in there anyway. But there are some chemicals out there that once they plug into that receptor site, they lock into it, and that's it. They cannot be reuptaken. They cannot be excreted. It's there forever, and that's the case here. What do you think of that so far? Is there a way? Is there is there ahead. a way to de, is there a way to detox this stuff out of our body? That was my question. I, also, I I have um, I have my doubts for one main reason because of the nature of the chemistry involved in doing such a thing, the way it's being done, how it's integrating itself into the receptor sites, it's, it, becomes, it actually becomes integral to your tissue. It cannot be exc excreted. And this, to me, is this whole transhumanism agenda. Well, clearly yeah. that's what it is. It's, it's, what, what do you think that they are doing this for? What's the goal for them? Are they somehow harnessing our energy. What's going on there? I, I believe it's a combination of several things. You know, harnessing energy, making, um, you know, basically, you know, the whole entire um, agenda of the Illuminati is to create dissent and contention, disruption, bloodshed, and all that produces negative energy. And the fourth density entities, you know, the alien greys and, you know, people that cahoots with them, they feed off of the negative energy literally like, uh, you know, it's like food to them. And so they're collecting it more and more and more. That's one, one side of it. The other side of it is depopulation. Not quickly, but slowly. Ted Turner, you know what Ted Turner is? He um, had um, paid... CNN. Hmm? Where's the guy from CNN, isn't he? I believe so. Absolutely, yeah. He's a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah, a yeah, that kind of, yeah exactly. He erected in in Georgia a what what is called the American Stonehenge, or it's more. Um, oh, he did that. that. No kidding. Yeah, the the the, 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 guy the Georgia guide. Stone. Guide Stone. Guide Stone. Guide Stone. Exactly. Yep. What is mm -hmm. the what is the first commandment on those guide stones? That's detox, that detox the world population. 500, billion, 500 million or less. 
Yeah, exactly. So, in other words, basically like 80 to 90 percent of the population they're going to do away with. And that's basically the idea. You know, it's funny that you mentioned I was literally just talking about that. I went to go look out to the lake today just to kind of get some peace of mind and talk to some friends about this stuff. And it's just, it's jaw-dropping for the average citizen to try to reckon this into their worldview. They don't, you know, there's still a yeah. lot of cognizance and just normalcy bias out here where people still expect FEMA and DHS to come clean up the mess um, after a natural disaster, some type of cataclysmic event. I mean, I don't, just don't know what people are thinking out here when we have a zombie apocalypse preparedness kit on the CDC's own website. Well, you know, I mean, that's the perspective for me. As far as, I, as far as I know, this is my theory on the whole zombie thing, I believe that zombies are not, you know, not reanimation of dead tissue through some kind of exotic technology. It's not about that. In my, in my opinion, what it's about is basically turning most of the population into Manchurian assassins by implanting altars, alter personalities that have been, um, you know, that all, all this stuff has been figured out, you know, using Project Monarch, Project Mannequin, and, you know, My Labs, and all this other crazy stuff. And what uh, it all um, originated from was the MK Ultra projects. But what I call, what everybody calls MK Ultra, I call it MK Extra, because MK Ultra is, was a compartmentalized, you know, think tank type of um, 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 project. But MK Extra, what I what I call MK Extra, is the very same thing, but on a global scale. You know, and you nailed it again. I mean, you're just so on the brainwave with us. I mean, literally, just talking. You know, the, essentially the whole population has been MK to some degree. Exactly. Um, as a, you know, it's very disheartening to consider that. Um, and there's been a lot of work that's been done in this area um, by lots of different people. Tom Horn and Steve Quayle have gone there with these satanic super soldiers that you hear about. They conjecture that there's yes. upwards of a million yes. of these. Um, and so we know that this kind of stuff is clearly going on. And so will the public take to it um, to a degree in which we'll ultimately, you know, reach that critical mass where everything kind of jumps off? or Will we break that system down? Because we've seen that with, in regards to the AI, because the AI can't compensate for love energy. It can't compensate for human emotion, though it does try, because it seems to have, our emotions seem to have a creative effect in our environment. You know, what would you say about AI being able to control in the environment through human interaction? I believe that is very possible, because during certain, um, let's just say, altered states, I truly believe that I've been able to alter the outcome of future events based on sheer will alone. Now, what um, I believe AI is endeavoring to do is emulate control processes of, of the astral realm through the use of a biological conduit, because it itself cannot do it. Now, the artificial intelligence that's currently um, in place, I believe that it's missing um, one key component. And here, here we go. I'm going I'm to explain exactly what is needed to build a device that is capable of accessing the astral realm electronically. Here we go. You mentioned earlier about the pineal gland. The pineal, it's all about the pineal gland. One of my theories, as far as that goes, is taking, it has to be fresh, live, human pineal tissue that's been biopsied and cultured and grown in the proper growth media on top of a silicon or gallium arsenide substrate. From there, because of the uh, properties of the pineal tissue itself, which allows you know, detection and interaction with the astral realm, you know, the ethereal realm, if you will. What I first would like to do is try to detect the uh, the presence of what I call non-biological life forms, or other otherwise known as ghosts, demons, angels, shadow people, whatever whatever, whatever those uh, ethereal life forms are called. I want to detect them electronically using that method. Basically, it's a it's a brain computer interface, but the interface itself is also biological. 
but you don't need a whole human being to do it. You just need a little bit of tissue from the pineal gland itself to do it. And I don't think that AI has been doing that. What do you think of that? I think that's fascinating theory. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really kind of something that makes me want to not think about because I understand the power of the human mind. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. bring that thing into the distance of my intention, buddy. That's a pretty nasty thing. I mean, I was thinking more along the lines, um, and I really, I mean, that, that is certainly a plausible explanation that you just gave and a fascinating one. Um, I was thinking more along of being able to, to, you know, literally steer people. And we have the document to say that these types of microwave technology and others, you know, can, can literally, quote, steer people in real time via inaudible microwave transmission, end quote. And you know, these are people simply doing acts that are of their own volition, which are actually being controlled by some other type of stimulus. When you hook that type of a capability up to an AI, and it's, it's making decisions based on the algorithm and all these other things that it picks out of the, the consciousness stream that it's basically monitoring at all time through our choices on our smartphones, the choices on our TVs. It's ultimately all running through this fiber optic network at the end of the day, which you know we've also shown there's a great study with DARPA and uh, SMU back in I, a few years back that have shown that you know they're trying to you know they always try to make it look like they're going to do something good with this technology, which of course there may be positive applications for some of this technology, but it's just not something that you want to have you know in the hands of people that can uh, exploit it. But they've shown that fiber optics can can interact with human consciousness and and literally in the in the tissue of the human organism and. When we get it to that phase and people begin to understand that and understand what fiber optics really is, I mean, every single one of these towers out there is hooked up to fiber optics. Your computer is hooked up to fiber optics. This phone call is able to be had today because of this fiber optic technology, which if we do our research, ultimately goes back to these grays or these other ethereal beings that we were exactly. talking about earlier. What factions do you see that really are the ones to worry about in here? Well, who are the people back here pulling these strings? Um, I believe it's a combination of several different groups. But um, here we go. Let me try to break it down for you. The, um, you know, the, the uh, Trilateral Committee and the um, Committee on Foreign Relations, Bilderbergers, those, those group of people, right? Those guys, I believe they may not be acting on their own volition. I believe that they've been uh, um, compromised on all levels of consciousness, technologically speaking. And the ones responsible for that are uh, very powerful and malevolent extraterrestrial biological entity. You could call that a fallen angel, maybe. You could call that Maybe some people people would call that a demon. You know, there's argue. You know, there, there's room for argument here amongst the terms which people call these things. But there is a common denominator between all these things, and I strongly agree with your conclusion there. In fact, it's my own, really. Um, and how are we going to overcome these guys? I mean, are they kind of using this AI as like a remote control in a sense? Well, it's still in the experimental phase. Um, it's, it's still in the phase where, um, think of it like this. You ever taken a, one of those little small red laser pens? You know, those, uh, I believe they are uh, 632.8, no, 632.8 TLA neon. I believe it's 680 or the six, either way, the red laser pens. You can remote control a cat with those. Most cats will react and you can guide them to, you know, point A, B, or C using that you know, method. It's very simple, but uh, imagine something more sophisticated than that being done to us on several different levels. The first um, type of uh, thing I, I wanted to talk about is being attacked by these um, orbital masers. I've been attacked, um, even recently in fact, about maybe two weeks ago, by um, what I believe to be orbital masers. And the reason why I think that is because based on what I know about, you know, radio wave propagation and electrical wave phenomena and the aperture size of the emitter of the maser, which is only maybe about two or three millimeters, based on the beam divergence of 
the emitter, or the beam divergence of the uh, of the said beam, by the time it gets from its uh, position up in space to the ground level, it would have only diverged to a spot maybe about the size of a dime or a quarter. And that's exactly the area and the size of the burns that I've been getting. What are they doing at that point? I mean, you know, this is an attack of some sort. What's, what are they trying to do? Well, they want to freak you out and make you panic. And once you do that, then they know they have you because during, this, during that fact, you're being monitored thermographically through your roof by, the, by these satellites. They can see your thermal heat signature right through the roof. Whether you're, you know, whether you're on the crapper or smoking a cigarette or whatever, they can see that. And they can also see if you uh, all of a sudden jump up out of your seat and start running around the house. They look at that. Once they see that they've... Okay, you know, uh, you're right. When you say this kind of stuff to people, it automatically sends off some type of default programming in, in, in a lot of people, which, you know, wants to just immediately dismiss this account of some type of lunacy. And well, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's the, unfortunate. Uh, that's, the, that's what modern doctrine has been, uh, you know, instilled with the belief of. And I'm not, you know, a typical you know, science-oriented individual. I've always been... Well, so what's so amazing is that we have overlooked the ancient traditions which clearly speak of these types of things, and, and the Mahabharata, and the Rig Veda, and the Sumerian field, right. and the Egyptian mythology, even Greek, and throughout our exactly. history of so much evidence of these types of occurrences and even the depictions of you know these gray type beings as far back as 3000 BC in Australia for example yeah, how is yeah. it that we don't overlook this and is it a sign that these people maybe this technology is more advanced and has been implemented much more than what we think it is and, and how long have they been here how long have they been doing this because I would argue it clearly goes back so certainly the, the, the 1950s, uh, okay. and, and even prior to that. I would say that the, um, the so-called alien greys, or as I like to refer them to as the Eloa greys, have been here on this planet uh, in, you know, in subterranean um, caverns and bases that they had built for them about 250,000 years ago. Now, this... Uh, that same exact figure pops up again and again and again as far as um, you know, the, the legend of um, how corn came into you know, existence. Before 250,000 years ago, there was no corn, and the Indians said that the corn was given to us by the gods. And that occurred apparently 250,000 years ago. Now, also in the um, you know, in, uh, Indo-European era, area about... Um, you know, around you know Norway and those places, most, most you know mostly in the area of Sweden and such. About two hundred fifty thousand years ago, all of a sudden, the um, blue eye marker showed up. So there's all this, all these different correlations of uh, spontaneous natural events occurring within that time frame, two hundred fifty thousand years ago. What do you think about um, the blood types with, like, the Rh negative factor? How that correlates that, to all this? The, um, according to all the research I've done, the um, type O Rh negative blood factor is what all of those Illuminati blood liners are about. They all have the same blood type, and they all intermarry with other ones of the same blood type. Now and you're saying like they're that. all Rh negative? They're all Rh Correct. Correct. That's really where the term blue blood comes from. Now, is that to say that those people are inherently bad? I mean, what, how do you view that? Um, that's, that's really an in-depth question. I mean, I've been trying to rack my brain on that myself because according to, as far as I know, my, my theory and my take on that whole thing is that the, uh, the rhesus blood factors are extraterrestrial. And anybody that possesses it inherently has 
this, um, what do you call it, um, propensity for egomania, if you will. Make sense? Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is because I'm A negative, and there's something funky about my bloodline and my father, how he was, um, my, my, there was a lot of secrecy around my father's birth. So quite frankly, I, I feel I have been protected from being taken into these programs because my father was, there's a secrecy around my father. I don't know. So I'm just, it, it's just interesting to throw that out there. And we were looking at the RH negative and this, some of the abilities that come with that, it's an, you know, psychic type intuitive um, insight. And a lot of this stuff was not really available to me till later in life. And I feel like that was for a reason because when they, when you show a certain amount of potential at a young age, they, they pull you into these programs and use you. And so super soldiers. So I think I was protected from this stuff. Um, I never showed those abilities as a young child. It didn't come out. It was kind of latent in me until probably my 2030s. Yeah, I understand. Um, I, I have psychic abilities myself and intuitive abilities that uh, sometimes surprise me. <laughs> But um, I don't know if I have the basis blood factor. Um, according to my um, medical history, it's just B positive. But um, I don't know if there's a, um, a factor as far as RH blood factor goes in psychic abilities versus another blood type. Because as far as I know, I don't have RH, but I might. I don't know. Wouldn't surprise well, we me definitely. Too. We definitely are all finding each other not by accident, and even though this system, you know, I, I kind of look at it like this. I, I feel that we are, since we're unplugged from the system we're, and we're aware of what's going on around us like others are not, that we yeah. are like on, there's no time delay with us. We're in real time. We're in now time, and everyone else is like on time delay with the system like a radio time delay, like a TV time delay, because they're not awake, they are being affected yeah. by this negative artificial timeline, and we're, we're actually changing the timelines. We change timelines all the time. It's yes. crazy. Every time, you, every time you make a decision, anything you could possibly do or whatever, it's all, it affects everything on the quantum level. From every moment to moment, you're creating a different timeline. This is one of my theories. You, you know about Maxwell Planck? Yes, the name sounds familiar. Okay. Um, he was the, um, a really heavy-duty scientist, and he um, came up with a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, theories and constants involving, you know, space, time, electromagnetism, and such. And what I call the Planck area is something in the order of um, 10 to the minus 40 second, 10 to the minus 40 second centimeter squared which I call the uh, 3D pixel of space-time. And I believe that um, that same constant applies to time itself. You know, something on the order of 10 to the minus 40 second seconds is an increment of time itself, a quanta of time. Now, if any actions occur within that time frame from moment to moment to moment, you're creating a different timeline on the quantum level. We just wanted to share something with you that we um, that we experienced when we started looking into this DARPA documentation, going back to something that Berkeley was doing, and started in late 1996, early 97, and it was called modeling in an artificial universe. And the whole right before the the huge encryption that followed, it, it started with begin complex system 666. And when we uncovered this document and all the documents that came with it that made us start to put together a timeline on how all this stuff has progressed since that, about that area, um, that's also when they started introducing GMOs into the food. I just found that out yesterday. Um, there was something going on around 96, 96, 97. All this stuff started coming flooding in in a big, bad, fast way. Um, well, when we, when we looked at that information, and, and acknowledged it the very next day, 
everyone was going, something's different. Something's different. I don't know what it is, but like, like a whole bunch of people kind of like were shaking off this feeling of being in an artificial timeline. And we also, like, I think it was two months to the day after that was the day that the government shut down and the same day that the very hall, it was uh, Corey Hall at Berkeley, had a huge explosion. So the Corey Hall is the place where this system was propagated out of. And what it is essentially is the Ptolemy stuff, which kind of revolutionized the way business is done and heterogeneous modeling on an artificial level are with computer systems. And the compartmentalization doesn't really, you know, what it covers up is the fact that this is interfacing with the human consciousness. And this is what we've come to find out ultimately with the blue beam and the other stuff is essentially, you know, we live in this holographic universe so is, is certainly one way to think about it, which is, brings a sense of tangibility to a lot of different problems that we have when we talk about time and other things. Um, yeah, but, holographic universe, huh? yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, you know, it's a reasonable consensus for us to come to put a human understanding on something with our language at this point. But that the documents start out with a PowerPoint presentation, which is is a painting of the the Tower of Babel and. This is all a reference to Babylon and all of these. There's all these biblical, scriptural references in here, and it doesn't matter what we believe, because what we're looking at, well, I uncovered an email log from the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Division of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, which is at Corey Hall um, up there in the San Fran area. And, you know, it's, a, it's an email log between these different reputable professors from Berkeley and a couple of other universities, along with senior ranking DARPA officials. And it's an email log, and it starts off that they're actually going to get a child from China, the quote, China connection, end quote. And this is a gentleman named Edward Lee. And when you see somebody like shadow.darpa.mil, again, shadow, shadow.darpa.mil, nobody had ever seen that before. Yeah, and it's pretty, you know, what we're, you know, the, the, the real thing to ask somebody off the top is, is why is this email log showing 666 as a specific intentional numeric value which they have assigned to this system, which is all ultimately about the collapse of the wave function. I mean, just the act of observation is what Kim was really talking about when the next day everybody was talking about, you know, things felt different. I mean, when we make an observation, it does have a quantum ramification, and these things do play out and open up different realms of potentiality or timelines in which we can then resonate into an experience. And this well, system it collapsed on, you know, the, the hours before the government shut down. Berkeley was evacuated because of an explosion at Corey Hall, and it all goes back to 1996, and with the cherry on top here for you, when they're trying to tell us the last government shut down was in 1996, which is when we had the Telecommunications Act introduced unconstitutionally, in which it had a, a set of criteria that had to be met by major telecom companies mandated from the FCC, which is the regulatory committee, over all of these different frequencies and stuff. The frequency allocations all come from the FCC. Um, you know, the bottom line is um, this system crashed. We had an NSA meltdown a week later, which set their whole facility back, you know, over a year, according to many different articles. All that stuff happened within a week time span. And we know on the quantum level, just the act of observation, the whole premise of quantum theory is the act of observation affects things on a quantum level. And so what would you say about us being able to break through this system? Can, can it compensate for human consciousness? Or are we able to break it? Because it simply cannot all the infinite potential that we muster. I can believe it can be fooled. In fact, one of the ways that I fool the AI myself is by pulling the battery out of my phone. And by doing that, it'll, it allows me to basically hop around instead of, um, you know, you get the, you know, the handshaking that goes on when you roam around from uh, place to place and it, it shakes hands with from cell to cell. But if you break that cycle, it confuses the AI. It does. It that. puts a whole algorithm. You're not sticking to your current pattern, and certainly they can monitor you through you through your devices. I mean, 
is it possible to even potentially use the frequencies that would be coming into your device to be a satellite or what have you, would be at a tower or any other methodology there. Is it possible for you to focus your own resonance back into that system or to have an effect in the system? Um, I believe that it's possible to do it alone. Just by um, basically, you, you know, if you're looking at something, you think about you're looking at something else. And if you're thinking about something, immediately change to some random obscure thought that would um, be otherwise confusing to something trying to keep track of it. That's that's one of my theories. Another one of my theories, as far as the um, quantum effect of consciousness goes, somebody once told me something very philosophical that hit me pretty hard, and I just can't shake it because it's, it, it makes so much sense, but it's, it's just so simple. Here we go. Who is the center of the universe? Or what is the center of the universe? I, I want to say God. <laughs> how about you? I mean, it says, I mean, yes, yes, I've heard that. Yes, I've heard that. Things largely that. relative to the observer. I mean, the question becomes, for me, how does the collective intention or the collective consciousness stream have a more pronounced effect than the individual stream of consciousness? And what are the energetic processes that occur behind two or more consciousnesses meeting at an intersection point? What goes on beyond that? I mean, because there's fragments of God within some people, I guess is a good way, uh, within all people. And it's kind well, of how God expresses himself or itself. As far as I know, what I've, become, what I've come to realize for myself, a fragment of God is life, all life forms, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, protozoan, or a human being. Anything that's, that, that has animis, animism properties, you know, the properties of being biologically animated, even if it's at the molecular level, is a piece of God itself. That's, that's one of my theories. Another um, one of my theories, as far as consciousness goes, is collective consciousness has a greater impact on our physical environment, our physical world, than any single one consciousness does. And that's what the um, shadow government and AI is endeavoring to do. Basically, by steering an entire collective to think and act in one way or another. They're trying to manipulate reality on a co collective level by infiltrating the collective. You nailed it right there. That's exactly, you know, I'm not going to speak for Kim, but that is exactly how I think we both feel about that aspect of it. And so, you know, I would say that there's certainly historical precedents for AI being in our society, um, just as much as there are subterranean beings from an extraterrestrial origin being, you know, in our Earth, uh, we clearly have that backed up with tons of ruins and things that have been found where, I mean, just the excavation alone really kind of certainly rivals that of the Grand Pyramids in Egypt. And to think that they excavated all this rock out of these caverns, you know, made their own network of tunnels and food reservoirs and water and, you know, ventilation shafts and all the things that they would need makes you really wonder um, yeah. who this was and what's going on. Clearly, it still has an influence here today. Have you seen any, you know, it sounds like you're a pretty well-read and, a, you know, pretty well, you do a lot of research. Um, would you say that there's any historical precedent for AI um, in biblical scripture or, you know, any other? Well, uh, I'll, I'll elaborate on that whole subject right here. About every 10,000 years or so, it's genetically proven that what, is, what occurs is what is called a genetic bottleneck. About every 10,000 years or so, some kind of cataclysmic extinction event occurs that wipes out like 99% of the population. Whether it's natural or, or some, you know, some creatures have their hand in it, whatever the case is, about, it seems like every 10,000 years, my, like, you know, most of humanity gets wiped out. And that can be proven genetically. And so there's that. And then on top of that, as far as the Bible goes, all of the um, stories that are being told about you know, prophets hearing what, um, what God's intent is, and then you have other prophets getting conflicting information 
you know, saying, um, you know, do the opposite thing. I believe that there's more than one force using the same kind of technology to steer us. It's kind of what complicated. Other forces, <laughs> now, to say, what other forces do you think it is other than this AI? Or I mean, it just seems to me like it's it, it feels like a spiritual war to me. Like this, it is. you know, it, my my theme here when I see this soul catcher and this transhumanism agenda, um, it, it just looks to me like someone's trying to steal souls and ma and make us think it's cool that we are going to get an avatar body and live forever in this you know, man-made machine with all the movies and the Terminator and all, all the stuff that, you know, all the cyborgs, and they, they make it all cool so that people are ready to sign up for this stuff, and they're getting duped the whole time that their soul is going to get stolen while they're in the process of this crap. I mean, that's yeah, to me where it feels like it's all going. It seems that way. I mean, the thing that um, always bothered me is, even if somebody were able to, say, download their consciousness, I don't think that actually can occur. But it can be copied. A facsimile of the original can be produced. But the original itself cannot be transferred. Right. So that is this where the cloning comes in? I mean, I don't really understand that aspect of, of what happens with a clone or what's the purpose of a clone. But are you familiar with any of that technology? Yes. I know exactly how cloning works. <laughs> and there's several different ways for which it can be accomplished. And all depending on what organism it is would um, give you a, a specific method as to how to do it. But um, the simplest method would be to take a, um, a human embryonic ova, an un 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 unfertilized embryonic ova, you know, and then you remove the nuclear DNA, the genetic material out of it. And then you replace it with the nucleus of uh, the cell of the being that you want to, you want to copy. You insert the, um, that genetic material into there. But then you have to treat it with, um, I believe it's um, telomerase, which is an enzyme that would uh, cut off the, um, the telomeres, which are basically the, you know, the biological clock of the cell itself. So you don't want to clone a, a person that being, at, say, uh, 45 years old, unless that's what that's what's wanted. You want to start fresh from you know the cell to the fetal stage and and so on. But uh, all depending on how the cloning is done, you could render a infant or you could render a, a full-grown person that's that's rendered and grown. But um, depending on how the telomeres are manipulated in the beginning gives you your net result. What do you think is the purpose why they're doing that? I mean, and then, and then my second question is, so we've been hearing many people talking about soul transference. Is that the same thing? Like they could take a soul out of a dying person and put it into this clone, and now this person just lives on in another body? I don't think that's actually the case because my theory is that um, souls themselves are, you know, they're transferred from some kind of ethereal realm. And even a, a clone with a blank slate, so to speak, you know, so you have a 35-year-old you know, clone that has, you know, zero data in its hard drive. It's still alive. It still has a soul, but just doesn't really have a mind, so to speak. But um, that cannot be um, that can that can't really be of any use to anything unless you have a, a, a um, which, how am I wording it a um, a bunch of software that emulates the uh, original um, specimen that was copied. What I think is being done with these clones is um, some kind of um, research as far as um, how to manipulate human beings on the surface, because a lot of the clones. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a lot of a lot of uh, what we have been experienced. Well, a lot of what we have heard lately is that a lot of the Hollywood um, actors and such are clones, and that this I, I'd recently heard about this um, 
the subterranean race called Vril, and that this, these Vril are animating a lot of these Hollywood actors in these cloned bodies. So I just don't know if you know anything about that or what that, you know, I guess they that might they clo Go ahead. That might, in fact, be the case. I mean, you could take a clone and, in, in, and introduce some, some internalized um, hardware, if you will, that's basically the receiving antenna and interfacing hardware for which allows the operator to operate and control the clone. And they're using um, what is called brain-computer interface technology to basically transfer and coordinate the control of, of themselves into a um, remote being. You ever heard of um, emotive technologies? Emoto, like Dr. Emoto? Uh, no, emotive. It's um, e oh, emotive. Oh, em e m o t i v technology. Mm, it was just recently. Sounds vaguely familiar. Um, it, it, it is the um, the most cutting edge um, piece of hardware out there, as far as I'm concerned, because it involves a direct neural link to the, uh, the person that is wearing this headset. And there's no invasive, um, nothing invasive at all. It's completely passive. And it, it, um, it, it's so sophisticated where all you have to do is put on the helmet. It's actually a little headset. It looks like, looks like a, um, a glorified piece of headphones. And you put this on, and it has to calibrate to your brain folds. That's the only, that's the only thing uh, that you have to do. Everybody's brain folds are different. So the say the you know the auditory cortex and such are in just slightly different locations from person to person to person. It has to calibrate against that, and once it does that, then it has a um, successful interface to such an extent which it allows you to think and type what you're thinking into text as you think it. Once it's calibrated, that technology is commercial now. It's about two thousand dollars to buy this device. That very same technology is being used by what I call clone operators. They go into you know, into a um, hypnotic state, if you will, and they put on this uh, technology that directly links to a clone. And then they can operate the clone. And whoever, whoever, um, whatever personality the clone happens to be under the influence of just depends on who's wearing the transmission end of it. And that's all occurring underground. That and so it's done. very quite plausible also that AI could be doing that on a massive scale. I mean, certainly they would do with key figures, and they would want to play out key figures in that avatar-type fashion. But, you know, ultimately it seems like they're going to be doing this with an AI across the whole thing from my perspective. I would argue, just for food for thought, I mean, what do we think about, guys, the construct of the universe having this holographic origin of, of some type of holography that's ultimately generated from some type of a computer type program device. I mean, there's that whole theory out there. Um, I'm not saying I'm a proponent of it or not, but what are the ramifications of that, and is it possible, and, and, and is there any evidence for that from your perspective? Well, as far as the holographic universe thing goes, I believe that this entire reality is, as we so call it, that we all agree upon is real, that we all are interacting in, is some kind of elaborate petri dish being um, monitored by some really advanced being. But I believe that whatever this uh, petri dish happens to be, some, some group has already discovered what it is and how to interact with it on that level. And then using that to control us from that level as a lower level. Make sense? Now, do you think that's like this off-Earth, you know, the, like I've heard people refer to Archons or, you know... Yes, the Archons. I've heard about them. Um, I believe they're the progenitors. Progenitors are the ones who made the Anu, who made the, and the Anu made the Anunnaki, and the Anunnaki then made the, the, the greys and us, so to speak. 
But yeah, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, Ar the, Ar the Archons, they're, they're, the, um, they're the head honchos in this neck of the woods, galactically speaking. Well, I've heard many sources say that we're removing that from this realm. Yes, that's um, what I, I've heard from many sources also as far as the uh, resonance of our, the resonant frequency of our collective consciousness and our planet as a whole is transcending from this dimension to another one. But I'm still having trouble wrapping my head around that whole thing. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, they're trying for to keep us here as food, as you said, emotional food. Right. Because when if they don't have us, they don't have anything. So, I mean, they're always keeping us in a constant state of, you know, of fear. And, I mean, everything that's done through the media, it's all fear-mongering, and they feed off of that. Fear and frustration and fighting and war and all this stuff. And, exactly. you know, I, I believe that, you know, our way around this is to detox and raise our frequency and realize that we do create our, create our own reality. We are the center of our own universe. And what I've been doing is taking, like, high um, frequency music when I drive to work in the morning, and I'm intending to send and project that the power of intention with coupled with love into the towers and to just blast this planet with a higher frequency, and I'm, I'm telling you, um, I really feel that these towers, that we can use these towers to do exactly the opposite of what they're intending to use them towards us as weapons, and we can use them to evolve the consciousness of this planet. And You're absolutely correct with that, but there's one yeah. major issue. There's one major issue there, though. The, okay. the issue is, in order for the system to be um, infiltrated by goodness, if you will, is mm -hmm. for it to be on a collective level. Not any one person by themselves can do this because they're, the forces of evil are very strong and widespread. So what would have to happen is for a collective group, all together in unison, in tandem at the same time, project good thoughts, good intention, and raise their frequencies but it has to be done on a collective group level at the same time in order for it to be successful. Yes, many, many groups have done that. And yes, I, I also want to ask you this, because you know, I know all of us, for the most part, have experienced targeting and um, attempts on our lives. I've had a pretty nasty attempt on my life in 2007 from another realm that I couldn't see. But do you think that just kind of like a John Connor experience in a Terminator, that this AI can see far enough in advance on what we might be able to do and try to take us out before we do what we're doing? <laughs> that's what I've. That's exactly what I've been afraid of, because yeah, um, the, the, there's the, the, the subterranean levels, you know, below the surface here. There are. May, uh, several different groups that are, you know, that are in control of the entire, um, the entire strategy and the entire process, and these, this collective group are psychically gifted remote viewing Nazis, mm -hmm. and um, they're they're uh, they're a real uh, serious heavyweight contender uh, as far as all that goes, and. Um, they're, they all have this ability to be able to um, remote view collectively into the future based on whatever target they decide to uh, focus upon. And using that information, they can um, extrapolate the game plan. And uh, that's exactly what I think is going on. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of what I thought when the attack came on. But, but since that attack and since I lived through it, um, my abilities have only become stronger and more clear, and their ability to distract and attack have been weak, weakened, mine, mine and continue well, to weaken. Yes. I, I, I've had a, a very a similar experience, um, as far as I know. Um, this occurred about 10 years ago, and for some reason I um, 
just felt this feeling of extreme fear, panic, and sheer terror overcome me. And I, I couldn't move, and I was completely um, just, you know, I was completely incapacitated with fear. And there was this person in my room. It was completely, the lights were off and everything. This person in my room, it was like 4 o'clock in the morning, um, was, uh, you know, I was, I was hiding in the blanket, and he was, you know, he was urinating on me and spitting on me, but wouldn't, nothing was said. But at the same time, I heard this voice in my head. It sounded like it came from my dad, but it, it was totally different than any B2K or subconscious technology type stuff. And it sounded like my dad, and he said, do not move. And I did exactly that, and I'm still here. But to top it off, right after this person left my room, just right after that, right after the door shut, it sounded like um, like howling, like a howling bobcat or something, some you know some kind of vicious, wicked animal that um, was, was was screaming right outside my bedroom with my bedroom door. And then that, right after that, that was a demon. <laughs> that was yeah. a demon. And, and mm -hmm. right after that, right after that, my entire room smelled like burnt cinnamon. And then <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> yeah, uh, I was I was so freaked out that I actually uh, checked myself into the, um, into the hospital. Just, you know, I was, just, I was freaked out. And what ended up happening, I was sitting there just, just you, know, it, you know, totally wide-eyed and um, freaked out. And this one uh, person in hospital garb walked past me. He looked at me and he said, you saw black, and then walked away. And Ew. that right there, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, since you I shared that, I'll share. My, I'll share mine after you're finished. Um, I think I'm finished. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> but uh, I've heard similar similar stories from different people that resonate with that. So go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was um, in 2007, two days before Christmas at my sister's house, and again, it was probably about the same time in the morning, about four in the morning, and I was. Um, I was in, in. I don't know what brainwave pattern I was in, but I was in between um, being awake and being asleep. So I was like aware that I was awake, but yet I wasn't awake. If that can right. make any sense to you, and I was completely paralyzed for like hours. I could not move, and I was like being held in this pattern. I, I would start to come out of it, and then I would go back in, and then at one point I was like fighting my own hands trying to drive a stake into my own heart. How the stake oh. got in my hands, how, I, I, I don't know I, I, any of that. All I know is that I, that I just experienced it. It was extremely traumatic. It, it freaked me out for days. Um, and then when, it, when the whole thing started to finish, I saw something go up into the ceiling, which looked like, I, I later figured it out, if you ever saw the movie Resident Evil, there was something that came out of the mouth of that thing that looked like a kind of like a spider or an octopus looking thing and that's what I saw go up into the ceiling now right after that I was awake and I was I mean I was still like in a dream I was at, I was like walking in my sister's basement and there were snakes everywhere and then I saw a gentleman who looked like a Middle Eastern man in his 30s and I renew him as Satan and I, I, I laughed. He was kind of kneeled down on the floor, and I said, "Oh, by the way, Jesus won." And I, and I, and I laughed like, you know, it was just this knowing, like whatever experience I went through, almost like I was, I don't know, like I expected it or something. And and then then it was finished and it was done. And ever since then, I again they haven't been able to touch me. It's like I'm completely protected. But maybe I had to go through that experience to, you know, maybe let them know that they can't touch me and to back off and it's pointless. But it was very traumatic. I mean, I, I, I was paralyzed for hours. I mean, wow. it, I couldn't move. It was, I mean, what do you do when you're in, you know, I, I've been in that pattern before and I've had, since then, I've had attacks, but um, even one that came into my bedroom probably about five years ago. Marcus was out of town, and I was sleeping. It was 4 o'clock in the morning again. My dogs didn't bark or anything, but I heard something in the room, and it was I could hear, like, movement, but I couldn't see anything. 
And then I felt like pressure like on my bed, at the bottom of the bed, like I heard something on my the top of the comforter, comforter and then something started crawling up my legs, like I felt like fingers on my side, started to crawl at my side, and I freaked out, and I turned the lights on, and I, you know, in the name of Jesus three times, and the thing went away. I never went back to sleep. I went to every area of my house and just prayed over it, and I've not had yeah. anything like that come since. But I'm telling you, these are uh, demons or beings in their dimensionals that are coming in and trying to screw, screw with us. And Yeah. Uh, the, this, the, the entity that I just talked about that, um, that attacked me in my bedroom like that, that was, I believe, a solid form because about, um, I believe, like th three or four years before that, they, uh, I, I, I believe I was, uh, a, a suicide attempt was made on me um, by some uh, malevolent technology or collective uh, conscious force. And um, what ended up happening is it just felt like uh, something took control of me. And I slashed my throat, and I was bleeding out everywhere. I mean, I, I had no control. It just happened. And right before, right, right before that happened, I saw what looked like a, um, like, you know, that, those big mutated dogs in Resident Evil, but in a shadow form, all you know, trying to claw its way into my room through the wall. That's what it looked like. And a bunch of, um, you, ever, you ever seen The House on Haunted Hill? Mm, I don't think I've seen it now. Mm. Well, they, they did a pretty good visual effect, as far as I'm concerned, to uh, emulate that evil force. But uh, it looked like um, like black smoke, like, you know, black shape of smoke that I could see all over my walls. And when um, when when uh, something took control of me to suicide me, what I ended up hearing and seeing right at that point as I was bleeding out. It sounded like, um, you know, the very exact same noise that uh, Xena Warrior Princess makes, you know, the battle cry. Oh, no, no, no. That, mm, <laughs> or the okay. noise, that, that, that noise that, that's made by, uh, you know, Middle Easterners when they, uh, you know, feel victorious or whatever, and during, you know, some kind of blood battle or whatever, that, that noise, that's what I heard at um I believe that it was uh, demons. That, that's a sound that demons make when they're applauding. And on top wow. of that, yeah. On, on top of that, the uh, these uh, black, smoking, shapeless figures were accompanied by um, very, very vivid. I could very vividly see it, and even hear the clackles of the um, of what I call the banshees mounted on horseback. There were thousands of them. And um, one even um, looked looked like a, um, a translucent, um, bluish, bluish grayish um, ghost that got right into my face and went and, and said my name, but in some kind of Irish accent. And um, I did a lot of research on that, and I have come to understand that these uh, creatures that I was confronted by were called the banshees, and. The, ban the term banshee is a Gaelic term, which means woman of the fairy mounds. And what really freaked me out, uh, after I found this all out, I was like, oh my gosh, because when I was bleeding out at that time, I saw between the frames of reality, if you will, you, you know, our, our human visual um, refresh rate is about 24 cycles per second, and your peripheral vision is like 40 cycles per second. But imagine between those frames, between every refreshed frame, seeing a different realm that overlaps ours. And I believe that I saw what was a glimpse of hell when I, when, when I saw this. And, um, yeah, it really freaked me out. Um, <laughs> I'm giving me chills right now just thinking about it. Um, but uh, I found out that Banshee means woman of the fairy mounds, and they make that, uh, that, that um, cackling, shrieking sound that you don't exactly hear it with your ears, you hear it with your soul. And um, there were a lot of the, uh, these mounted banshees on horseback were on top of a bunch of little, you know, small, uh, you know, rounded foothills that I could see all over in the distance. And I put two and two together doing my research. 
you know, in regards to Woman of the Fairy Mound. And I was like, wow, that's what that was, huh? And then from ever since that point, I was like, I better be a good person. Because <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get a second chance. Well, I, what do you mean? well, go ahead, guys. Real quick, I just want to say one quick thing. Just, I, I do find it interesting that they both, that both of us were try attempted to suicide ourselves because guess where we would go if we did that? <laughs> yeah, but, but so, I, have, I have a whole problem with that whole thing just for one reason. If something else took you under their control and you're influenced by it beyond your control, do you really deserve to go to hell or do they? Of course not. No, exactly. exactly. But it's like that set, that set up, you know, like it was by your own hand. Yours was a slit yeah. across the throat by your own hand. Mine was a dagger in my heart by my own hand. So you find mm -hmm. that. I just find that interesting to see that pattern, um, yeah. and obviously. So now, how did you survive that since you were bleeding out? What happened to get you help? Oh, uh, me, uh, like, like a couple of seconds after that occurred, so, um, I was just, it, it, whatever the force was, immediately left. And I all of a sudden came to my senses, and I started freaking out and panicking. And my, land, my landlady at the time, took me to the hospital. She's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this. You know, I was just, I was freaked out. And um, it's um, something that's like, it's really hard to explain to anybody else unless they've had the very same experience themselves. I mean, everybody else just goes, oh yeah, you were a psychotic lunatic under some kind of uh, psychotic episode and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, which uh, that's what modern doctrine has uh, instilled. Well, that's what they're educated to, um, or miseducated to believe, because anybody who tries to come out and really expose this stuff, their name is slandered and ruined, and you know their career is ruined, and it's only the people that are sellouts that actually stay in the industry. <laughs> Everybody else yeah. is either killed off or, or just made to be a lunatic themselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean that reminds me of my you know my whole entire philosophy as far as, as far as you know reality of today goes. I mean, I've always been a firm believer that uh, you don't need to go to school to learn. You can learn about whatever you want to learn on your own volition. And that's exactly what I did. I, mean, I um, learned about electronic circuitry and how to design electronic circuitry when I was only six years old. I designed and built my first helium neon laser when I was 12 years old. And I learned how to vaporize porcelain and rock electrically when I was like 12, and it's just, these are things that just occurred to me that I just, for some reason, innately knew how to already do, and um, I try to explain it to people, and they just go, oh, what school did you go to, or where did you learn how to do this stuff, and n nobody buys it, I, I just knew, you know, nobody can accept that, <laughs> and it's always been a, you know, a big problem with me, you know, for me to, to um, you know, when I'm trying to get a job or whatever, or trying to, you know, get my foot in some door, explaining myself and how I would come to understand this stuff, um, unconventionally speaking, people just don't buy it. For some reason, they don't have the capacity to. And I, I believe that's all part of the mind control thing. I absolutely agree. And, and the same way with me, I, I'm an author of you know, seven children's books, and people will say, oh, do you have kids? No. Are you a teacher? No. Are you a psychologist? No. Then how in the world are you authors <laughs> children's books? Because this is something, it's an innate gift. It's something exactly. that's natural. It's and we not, teach our children, natural. yeah, we teach our children to become good little slaves and don't, you know, don't speak out or step outside the box. We don't, we don't encourage their natural gifts. I mean, that's one of my goals in, in this lifetime is to is to change the system of, of education so that they been, are able to identify their gifts at a young age and nurture them. Exactly. That's, that's always been my entire problem with, quote, education, unquote. Um, because, you know, my unique talents, abilities, and skills, what have you, um, I just always possessed this, this gift for technological intuition and scientific intuition. And... Um, from from kindergarten to uh, sixth grade, instead of um, taking a child's prodigy and nurturing their gifts and 
you know, exploiting it, if you will, they decided to think that uh, putting me through special ed education classes with all of these special children and making me take speech courses with all the special children was the correct thing to do. To try to dumb you down and take your innate gifts away. <laughs> yes, and I, I, I'm a very stubborn person. I'm not going to let anybody do that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Well, I recognize, you know, when I was getting out of high school, just to go, you know, being prepared like everyone else was to go to college, I was like, I feel like this is dumbed down. I don't feel like this is a waste of my time. It's not, you know, I don't, when am I going to, there's no application of life. It's just a regurgitation of information. So I, it, it turned me off, and I went my own way. And... Most of my education, my science is also my favorite subject, so most of my education came through when I went through my spiritual awakening, and then I just devoured like book after book after book after book that I was led to on looking at all of these different areas from, you know, theology, theosophy, physics, metaphysics, quantum physics, all, all of these things, and they're all saying similar things, but they're all compartmentalized. Right. So and you that's, can't that's, put the picture together. Yeah, that's always been my, my the biggest problem I've had with uh, professors and such. I'll give you an example. One of my professors I had, he was a PhD in electromagnetics, right? But uh, he, he even pulled me uh, um, off the side one day and said, uh, don't talk about optics or biology because you'll embarrass me. Like, okay, fine, you know, but um, the problem with education today is they focus on one subject or one field of study and then beat it to death to such a point where that's all you end up learning about and knowing about. And if you were to take this, you know, take a person who has a PhD, this, that, and the other, and put them into a different room with a different specialty, they're completely lost. And I don't have that problem. <laughs> I mean, as far as, I, now, as far as I'm concerned, biology, chemistry, physics, all that stuff, it's all one. It's all one, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the whole system. I mean, the whole compartmentalized system, period. I mean, even mm -hmm. what they do with, with Western medicine. I mean, there's a place for Western medicine, but, um, you know, they're all highly paid pharmaceutical reps. So yeah. it's like, I can't, you know, I, Western medicine, you know, I've had surgeries on broken arm and things like that, so there's a place for it. But... You know, all they want to do when I go in to see my doctor is give me medication. <laughs> like, no, I don't want medication. I want an answer to yeah. what's wrong with my body. Why is it have symptoms of such? Don't tell the symptoms to shut up. When your car light goes on, you don't tell it to, you know, you don't unplug the check engine light. You actually go get something done about it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I've always known that. I mean, you, you know, um, they've, you know, these are. Uh, doctors that I've had to end up, that I ended up having to see, they would try to, um, you know, force me to take Ferroquil, Zoloft, Haldol, and all that bullshit. And I, I, already, I knew that stuff's poisonous. It's just, you know, poisonous to the soul, poisonous to the mind, poisonous to the body. And um, there's been studies that have been done that have been confirmed that, that um, someone who has been prescribed psychotropics, antipsychotics and such, for many years of their life, if you were to do a uh, positron emission tomography scan of their brain, the, uh, the um, neural tissue lesions that exist, they, they totally emulate and mimic the same exact cerebral tissue lesions, lesions of somebody who, uh, you know, would huff gasoline or paint. Wow. I was actually on the law for like five years. I had a severe anxiety attack and I was scared to go off of it because I didn't want to have another one. And I weaned myself off of it intuitively. I was just like, I know I don't need this. I'll deal with the anxiety that comes. And it, you know, I'll tell you what, I, when I went through withdrawal off of it, um, it was like a couple days after I stopped taking it, it's, I've probably been off of it like eight years probably. Um, it was like it, I had an electrical impulse. Like it was kind of like an engine trying to start, but it wouldn't like roll over. 
So right. it was kind of like my body felt like it was kind of go, like trying to start something, but yet it wouldn't roll over. It was just the weirdest yes. feeling. It was like, you know what I'm talking I, about? I understand completely because I uh, was um, taking those uh, psychotropics for like two years because my wife at the time wanted me to do that because she said I needed help and blah, 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 blah. So in order to, you know, appease her, I just did it. Just, okay, what the hell? It'll make her happy, right? And so I did that. And a couple of years of having done that, I was like, you know what? This is bullshit. I'm not going to do this anymore. So I just abruptly stopped taking all of that stuff. And what ended up happening was uh, kind of nightmarish. I was um, wide awake, completely wide awake. My eyes weren't um, heavy at all for about two and a half weeks. So I'm just sitting there, you know, for two and a half weeks, the whole time just, you know, playing on playing on the iPhone and doing my own research about everything that I always do. And, yeah, for about two and a half weeks, I could not sleep for the life of me. So that's my experience I've, with that stuff. I've heard, I've heard other similar stories about people who who gotten off those things and, and had went days that without sleep. I've never heard anyone go two and a half weeks without sleep. That's not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that, re that required a uh, heavy regimen uh, at the time. And uh, I just, you know, I didn't want to do it at the time. And during the fact, I didn't want to do it, but I just did it just to, you know, make my wife happy. You know, anyway. <laughs> but um, all of that, um, all those psychotropics and all those, all those pharmaceuticals, they're being pushed on the public just at will by um, unscrupulous doctors, as far as I'm concerned, because they get kickbacks from the pharmaceutical companies. The more samples that they dole out to their patients, the, the more endorsements and kickbacks and such they get from Big Pharma. And um, that, uh, you know, coming to that conclusion um, led me to understand that these doctors, so-called are no better than some crackhead pushing crack on the street corner. They're no better and no different than that. Absolutely, absolutely agree. My uh, one of the people that I'm working with, um, actually on their board, it's a Coalition Against Overmedicating Our Youth, with a um, a pharmacist on the East Coast, and we are getting the word out about how dangerous it is. How they're they're not they're not looking at taking care of the causation, they're actually just going directly to drugs, but all of these symptoms from the ADD, ADHD, autism are coming from the, the, the toxicity of the food, the water, the air, and it's causing exactly. symptoms that are like that, and then they further drug the children, and then they're either killing them while they're doing it, or later on they become suicidal. Yeah. So yeah. It's, a, it's a big problem. Yeah, um, you're preaching to the choir there. I mean, um, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at remote viewing and extrapolating, you know, futures, future circumstances, and you know, seeing what might be, you know, hidden behind door number three. And so I'm pretty good at that kind of stuff. And what, um, what I've uh, come to the conclusion of is that all of this, um, you know, the genetically modified foods and the nanotechnology being deployed in the air. That's um, causing uh, behavioral shifts on a, a social scale, not a grand scale there. And the, um, I believe the, the biggest uh, financial benefactors of this entire project are the pharmaceutical companies because they use this uh, technology, the place of God technology and stuff, and um, target people with it. Then that means that... Uh, Big Pharma gets more money for pushing their psychotropics on them. So it's a big, uh, a big tangled web of deceit and lies that's the vicious circle. And, I mean, I, I, I see it, you know, very readily. And I try to explain it to people, and a lot of people just don't buy it. And so that's why I kind of get frustrated and just don't talk about it anymore because, I mean, who's going to believe me? Well, and that's the whole reason why we have these conversations and that why we are – doing what we're doing with, you know, doing conference calls and putting this stuff out there for people to hear. And more of us are finding each other and having these conversations so that, one, you know, we're not alone. Two, we can collaborate together. And that's one thing I want to make sure we ask you is how, 
how can we help you do whatever it is that you need to get done? I mean, is it is it by having an interview and putting it out there? Is it just, you know, getting other people like minds together to figure out what our next steps are? I mean, how far are you away from having the technology that you are working on to, you know, put out there free for everybody to have? I mean, I think this is phenomenal. What well, the only are... thing that I'm definitely in is time. I mean, I have to, you know, work a nine-to-five job basically and, you know, between breaks work on this technology because it's all of the equipment that I'm using for um, calibration and um, tuning is all on my workbench. And um, I have to do that, you know, when everybody else is not looking just to get things done. Um, but what uh, what I really do need would be to have, a, you know, a group of people like, you know, like-minded like myself that have more access and are more privy to uh, instrumentation, like, uh, you know, electronics instrumentation, fluke instrumentation, stuff like that, which would allow me to um, build a better machine. Um, I mean, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to build a device that basically does the same exact thing as some kind of um, high-end um, defense department level um, type of um, microwave radiation uh, spectrum analyzer. I'm trying to build something sort of similar to that but, uh, with the poor man's budget. And, and the devices that I'm mentioning, you know, is a microwave frequency spectrum analyzer, for example. I mean, even a, um, a refurbished used one, you're looking at at least 50 grand for the thing. That's exactly right. I had looked into it. I had a buddy who was, you know, in the industry, and he, we got to talk about the equipment. There are low-level monitors for electromagnetic radiation, which you can get, but they're not as effective as what you're looking for and what we really need. And so I think that a continual monitoring process, um, certainly for a duration of more than 24 hours, at least at the minimum a 24-hour period, but I would say more along seven days or a month even if possible, to compile all that data, particularly in individual cases like your own, if there is a stimulus that has been identified, um, you know, like you've mentioned before with the use of maybe some type of drug or whatever the stimulus may be, if that has been induced to then, you know, draw from that the changes that may be made in the environment, that's also very important. And then what do you expect to find after you have actually done this? I just want to be able to prove it to myself that that's what's going on in order for me to um, write the abstract for everyone else to um, peruse through and experience for themselves. Um, I mean, th think of a, um, when, you, when you take any kind of psychoactive material, I, I think of it as nothing more than, you know, you take the crystal out of a radio receiver and you plug in a different crystal into the circuit, and thus altering its um, reception protocols, its reception parameters. It goes from this bandwidth to that bandwidth and so on. And the same exact phenomenon occurs, neurologically speaking, on a chemical level. When you say uh, you take um, you know serotonin out of the receptor sites and re re um, replace that serotonin with tryptamine, which is a similar chemical, but uh, alters the uh, parametric um, characteristics of the brain. You understand about that? About what I'm getting at there? Eugene? Hello, Eugene. I do go. I had you on mute. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And, um, you know, I would just kind of, you know, what I'm leading to with the stuff that I'm researching is that there is clearly some type of, obviously, a manifestive effect with our consciousness in our physical environments. This is a very rudimentary aspect of our existence from my perspective. I think that this is something that we're trying largely from a subconscious perspective. And due to that fact, it's somehow difficult for us to ascertain because just the depth of it is something that's hard to grasp when we're doing it from the subconscious perspective. But beyond that, to see that there could be some type of, you know, call it artificial timeline generation, for lack of a better term, is what I would call it, um, in the sense that this AI and these other elements are seeding our consciousness in order to bring about a desired effect when we have these emitters and other types of tower arrays around us which are ultimately hooked up to the spiral optics, we have the propagation of the wavelength 
Uh, we have these different things then subjected to our consciousness on a variety of different levels, whether it be television, or inaudible frequency, or satellite beams, or all of the above, microwave radiation, terahertz radiation, you name it. Uh, exactly. And you put all this stuff in this kind of toxic soup, and you have the act of a human observation interacting with these different waveforms, which then, you know, the collapse of this wave function and this toxic soup that we're surrounded by is essentially then turning into the human consciousness and, and utilizing the act of our ability to create to, for its own bidding at that point. It's somehow bringing actual situations and events into our lives, um, regardless of what these things may be. I mean, this is a, an interesting solution to many of the different problems that we have, and certainly this is something that's all propagated kind of through the air. We think of, you know, us, uh, wrestling against things in the spiritual war or, you know, Lucifer is the prince of the air, for example. I mean, to me, this is kind of what makes sense in the, in, in the whole grand scheme of things in that this is the method in which they operate. And so, you know, I'm really, I'm really drawn back to the idea that you had of this biopsy, you know, third eye essentially hooked up to like an AI interface. Isn't that kind of what you were going with earlier? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's really spooky. <laughs> and, you know, I think that we touched on some things in this interview tonight that I'm probably uncomfortable talking about with, with some people, and I think that's unfortunate that I would even have that reservation. And it's certainly nothing that I don't want to share with anybody because, you know, when we talk about paranormal experiences, for example, it's a big one for a lot of people where they just don't know what to do with it. And more and more, however, I do feel like people are finding themselves experiencing things like this. And there is some type of a shift going on. Certainly, as you outlined earlier, we have these cyclical events in human history, which, you know, may you know, be a cataclysm. There's a genetic re-spark of life, which is basically some type of, of response to a stimulus on a global level. And, and beyond that, we kind of went to the place where is it possible to transcend that whole element of reality into a, basically a whole new sphere of enlightenment, you know, if we're going to be basically on the same planet but in a higher vibratory state, it's kind of one way that we could all think about that. Um, it's interesting to see the bridging of the gap trying to get there, and I think that, you know, it'll be real interesting to see if we do get there. Um, one way or another, I would argue that we would. I mean, I think that the the quest for human life and the, and, the, and the triumph of our spirit is a very profound thing, and it's, it's always something around us. You know, we get pretty polluted at times, and we have to really take a step back and learn from our, our collective mistakes. I mean, there's such a, a lack of imbalance in this world today. I think that everybody well, exactly, can agree on that. That's, that's know. exactly the problem. And the reason why it exists is to, is to thwart efforts to alter the collective consciousness, which would affect our reality in a, in a positive fashion. The, the, the reason why that's being hindered and prevented is so that the um, evil powers that be can maintain their foothold on society, and all of the dissension and and you know political and theological disagreements that everybody has, all of that is engineered to prevent a collective effort. I I, I strongly agree with that. I mean, absolutely. And so we'll continue to make our case as it comes to these things. You know, it's. We, we certainly have an uphill battle here when so many people are still kind of plugged into this, you know, matrix-type system, for the lack of a better term. Again, I mean, what, what are we going to call this, you know, system of artificiality, which is, you know, to me, Lucifer or evil or whatever it is tries to mimic anything organic, which is really the spark of what genetic code is all about. It has a holographic, you know, ramification. It has a manifestation in the physical on a holographic level through this resonant frequency that's coming out of just our DNA. It's so it's a vast storage medium. And to try to mimic that through a technological means um, to tear down the image of God, if you would, in our, which we're created, and seemingly what this is all about, and to capture that control. And so what a difficult thing for us to try to prove. And there's so many different types of of, of belief systems that are associated with these things, whether they're, you know, philosophical, esoteric, or, you know, religious. Um, how, well, from your perspective, man, how exactly 
what is the way in which we know and ascertain truth, or is truth permeable to some degree and relative to some degree? What do you think about that? Well, I believe that a, that's, a, that's a really uh, deep and layered question because all depending <laughs> on one's perspective and viewpoint, that, that's, that's what determines truth to the observer. And if their viewpoints and perceptions are nothing more than reception of false data, as far as that the recipient is concerned, that's the truth. <laughs> so there's that. But I there's a line. Song. There's a line from a song that I used to listen to when I was a kid, and it's real simple and short. And I'll let you finish up. I love where you're going with that, but it says, "Censored ideas counterfeit answers." Um, and I think that's kind of what you were just saying there. I don't know if it seems exactly like what you're saying, but sorry to interject. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, what what, um, what I believe the ultimate truth is, you know, God, if you will, is you know, it's, it's unchallengeable and totally unadulterated. But um, the wool is pulled over everybody's eyes from being able to observe that to such a great degree that I mean, I I, um, I personally know people that have had spiritual experiences so to speak, you know, seeing um, shadow entities and uh, having um, encounters with, uh, you know, poltergeists and such. And they just attribute it to, uh, you know, being intoxicated. And I'm going, no, it's more than that. It's more than that. You're, you're perceiving what exists, but your intoxication is allowing it to happen. And they Exactly. How does that make it any less real? I mean, you know, the we were listening to a, a gentleman named Alan Watts the other day. I don't know if you're familiar with him. And he says something to the effect of, you know, basically the collective personification that we have or the, the way that we look at ourselves, so to speak, in a materialistic sense and in a worldly sense is really the true hallucination here. And being that we're really not anything like these beings, which we conceptualize ourselves to actually be, and we're in, and, you know, that is the true hallucination from this perspective. And I think I agree with that to a very, you know, I think that's exactly spot on to tell you the truth because people are such in a, a, a fantasy world out here. Um, I don't know. It's like people are living out this hallucination and, and, and discounting tangible things that other people experience. When we have a communal experience, for example, on hallucinogenic drugs or any type of, right. any type of, you know, these things occur Consciousness is clearly having some type of, uh, of interdimensional manifestive effect in the environment. I mean, it's very that is clear. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. I mean, I I know that there's no such thing as mass hallucination or coincidence. There's no such thing as that. That's all BS. Um, because you, you you take you know different people and different groups of people who have um, let's just say altered their consciousness with the very exact same methods. And they all seem to have the same exact experiences. Now, if there were just hallucinations and random firing of the neurons, every experience would be unique. But that is not the case. Exactly. So, you know, it's kind of like having a battle between, it's like organic versus artificial. At the end of the day, when we come to this, for me, it's like, if these things are being induced by these false sets of answers and, and ideas that we formulate about ourselves, and it's, <laughs> it's a counterfeit realm in which we're basically projecting for ourselves. And truth, to me, is kind of what I call the fundamental things that we adhere to, regardless of agreement or acknowledgement. Yeah. And I would ask for anybody, you know, what is what is not relative to our own individual perception? Um, even the perceptions of others may be somehow linked to our own perception. So clearly, there's an interconnectedness there. And, it just makes me want to take a step back and be more careful with how I think and understand that thoughts are things, for example, is kind of a way of putting it that's simple. <laughs> well, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I mean, there's a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of things that are taking place to prevent um, self-enlightenment, like, uh, you know, fluoridation of the water, for example, is a big one. That... Uh, Florid water fluoridation. Spiritual lobotomy, as Kim puts it so well. Exactly. It's yes, so it's spiritual lobotomy. <laughs> what, what ends up happening, um, 
there's several things. I mean, I, I'm I'm really good at looking at. I I can just look at a molecule and go, oh, that's what it, that's that's what how it behaves. That's what its function is. You know, I mean, for example, um, the uh, my doctor tried to uh, prescribe me um, a um, what do they call that stuff? A, a statin, which is a um, a, uh, a cholesterol enzyme inhibitor. And I looked at I looked I just looked at the molecule and I'm like, oh, geez. There's, there's a fluorine sticking off the benzene ring, and uh, this uh, you know carbonyl group here is uh, <laughs> it looks malevolent. I, I mean, I just look at a molecule and go, oh man, that's that's something that'll that could cause um, you know disruption in enzyme function, disruption in uh, neurological function, and I just go, no, thank you, I'm not going to take that crap. <laughs> but uh, that's that's what's um, going on. I mean, on so many levels is. Um, the poisoning of the environment on, on all levels, and um, people are being prescribed, you know, a lot of um, a lot of drugs that are inhibitors, such as uh, Prozac and statins, which are all based on uh, the chemical fluorine. And any of those, um, any of those, they're very similar to fluoride in chemical composition. If I'm not mistaken, I think that Prozac is you know virtually identical to fluoride. Well, well, fluoride is just um, is, is just ionic fluorine in an aqueous solution. Um, Prozac um, is um, it just has it has fluorine in its molecule. But you know, I see. I, I saw a study where the shrimp that they were giving this Prozac to would go and kill themselves. Um, you know, they they die when they go towards the light. These small organisms, and they just. <laughs> They would they would be given the Prozac and they would just all swim to the surface and just die, kill themselves. Yeah, I understand completely, and I believe there's several reasons why that occurs. I believe it's not just about the chemistry and the action of the chemistry and the pharmacokinetics alone. I believe that the chemistry, in and of itself, is a triggering mechanism or a um, a key, if you will, which allows the uh, mind control the technology to take effect upon you. And what... Uh, That's very interesting. There seems to be a lot of... Re and to really understand that, and then you have to put somebody who would who would intentionally do something like that behind it all, it's really kind of sinister, and I think it scares a lot of people from looking into that. And what a formidable foe that we have here that seeks yeah. to do such things on such a grand scale. Wow, you know. Yeah, the um, the malevolent force responsible, they you know they call you know Satan or Beelzebub or whatever. This uh, this entity, this creature, you know, is as malevolent as malevolent can be, but also extremely extremely intelligent. So that's the most formidable adversary if I ever heard of one. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really, really, really into this stuff. I mean, I'm glad we're having this interview. This is great because... Um, well, you sound very knowledgeable, and, you know, it's all about sharing this type of information with people because that's how ultimately a rock is nudged to uncover a whole new element of compartmentalization. I mean, you know, I think that we're really onto something here when we look at the way the consciousness interacts and then we have the collapse of the wave function in order to bring about this holographic manifestation in the physical, whether it be in a situation or whatever. And that's kind of like worshiping the image of the beast. And it says power was given unto the beast to kill. And we're, you know, we can we can contrive these situations in our subconscious collectively and bring about a situation which kills people. Um, yeah. You know, that, the whole uh, Mark of the Beast thing, the 666 thing, that, that reminds me of something I was thinking about earlier which is um, it, the most basic fundamental shape in the entire universe is a triangle. Now, you take an equilateral triangle, which happens to be the symbol of the trilateral committee, happens to be the symbol for um, the Dulce base in New Mexico. It's um, the shape of um, the um, MyLab's um, craft, and the degrees of angle on an equilateral triangle are 60, 60, 60. Interesting, huh? Mm. It is. 
I mean, you see that pattern throughout, you know. I mean, you know, in the Bible it's written as the number of a man. We see that reflected in the molecular structure of carbon. Um, with there's three different, you know, atoms there that are the proton, neutron, and electron are all six, arranged in pairs of six. Um, and then, of course, when we get into the system that runs this, through the fiber optics, you have I mean, six. <clears throat> the letter Va, <clears throat> excuse me, the, 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 the character really, Va in Hebrew, the letter is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that is W. And if we really look at the, you know, is it possible that these RFID chips could keep us in a lower vibratory state? I mean, we, of course, we have this nano issue with the, the inhaled nanoparticulates. I still believe that the mark itself, which the word mark in Greek means to etch or prick into the skin and a badge of servitude, I believe that to be an RFID that would hold us in a lower vibratory pattern, essentially like a holographic prison at that point. And the fact that it's coupled with this system that has to do with 666, I mean, the, the, the chip itself, the implant, if it were in our bodies now, would be coupled with the World Wide Web, which, of course, was created by DARPA. You're, you're talking uh, on a subject that I exactly wanted to touch on. <laughs> um, you, you can continue, and then I'll go for it. Well, I just, I think a major unlocking secret of this entire episode with this Mark of the Beast gets into Chapter 15, because clearly we have a system being coupled with the World Wide Web that interfaces with consciousness, and I would argue that our worshiping the image of the beast is bringing about a negative holographic manifestation based on an AI seeding of our consciousness. Um, and when we realize in Chapter 15 that that's where we have the seven angels with the seven deadly plagues filled up with the wrath of God as they're about to pour these out onto the earth. Um, there, John sees a group of people who overcame and, and had victory over the name, the number, and the image of the beast. And they stand atop the sea of glass that glows of fire, is what it would say in the new international version, and some of the older versions might say sea of glass mingled with fire, sea of glass glows with fire. Um, to me, it's that's a mingled. very... Mingled yeah, with well, mingled in King James, it's, it's, it's glows of fire and like NIV, and it varies a little bit, but the bottom line is it's a very clear reference to fiber optic technology, which of course um, is a stated objective. That's going to be the sole conduit for all transmission in the future. That groundwork has already largely been laid, and it's been implemented to a very, very, very large degree. It's intercontinental. It's around this globe, obviously. And when we understand that that system is coupled with the sea of glass that mingles with fire, what does that mean to stand atop of this? And is that when, is it possible that that could be fiber optics to you from what you know? Well, before, uh, before I touch on that, I just want to say that I know pretty much everything there is to know about fiber optics. Now I'll elaborate completely. But I, I want to um, touch on this, the previous subject first. Um, in regards to what you said about Ba, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like a W, right? It reminds me of something I heard once upon a time as a child, because my, my mother was heavy into uh, religion and spirituality and such, and she would always talk about um, when the mark of the beast occurs, there's going to be the information superhighway and all this other stuff. Now, the information superhighway is the World Wide Web, and sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Ba, is W. World Wide Web, www. Huh? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. And then, um, as far as um, the uh, fiber optics thing goes, there is a uh, new type of fiber optics that's you know, cutting edge. Right? I, I'm really into um, looking at uh, you know, reading magazines such as NASA Tech Brief and ECN, EDN, all kinds of other um, you know top high-level um, engineering um, primers that come in every month, and there's this um, specialized type of new fiber optics that uh, it was, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't developed and commercial and became commercial, but it was classified for a long time, and for whatever reason was declassified, and then it hit the public sector. And then from there, the cover story is, oh, so-and-so discovered it, and blah, blah, blah. But um, anyway, the um, new kind of fiber optics that's going to be coming out 
is what they call um, light pipe. Or, um, essentially, it's a, um, you, you know how fiber optics are made, right? Where they take a, um, an ingot made of, um, you know, a, a Pyrex, they call it. Yeah, it's glass. It's a glass, but it's a conduit for a laser transmission that basically it transmits information at the speed of light. Um, is that the hollow core air fiber that you're talking about? No, no, no. Um, I have all kinds of equipment here that I experiment with fiber optics, just you know, making making my own trinkets and doodads. I mean, I have all kinds of gizmos here that work with uh, you know semiconductor lasers and fiber optics and doing you know propagation delay experiments and transmission experiments, just just on my own, just for the hell of it. I I love doing that stuff. I always have. But um, the type of fiber I'm talking about is imagine a um, a digital fiber optic core, which is you know a, a um, a, a, a drawn glass fiber. Now imagine inside of that drawn glass fiber a internal core that runs directly coaxial down that fiber, which is made of a semiconductor material such as gallium arsenide or indium phosphide or some other, you know, semiconductor material that transistors and microchips are made out of. But take it to the next level and make a fiber out of this material so Basically, you have a, um, a fiber semiconductor material that is, it has an affinity for a given band. So, in other words, it would transmit a, a particular frequency much more efficiently and effectively than any other frequency. But it's all based on the composition of the internal material itself. And but um, this uh, type of fiber is um, based on, I believe, is when they were um, developing the, uh, the pulse ruby laser. Now, I, I work with a lot of lasers and stuff just, just on my own, just, just because, but I like to do that. And um, a lot of the uh, resonator rods, they call them resonator rods, which are nothing more than just a, um, you know, a, a crystal made of, um, you know, corundum aluminum oxide doped with chromium, for example, which makes ruby. Some of those ruby rods, you look at you look at them, ed, um, you know, you know, edge on, side on, into a light source, and the outer perimeter of it is completely transparent, clear, while the core of it is red or whatever, and that's the active medium inside the rod. You know, the entire rod isn't active; just the core of the rod. And if you're to take that rod and make it much, much, much more finer into a fiber with the same exact um, premise, you know, having a core of active material surrounded by a um, material of um, similar composition but not active, you have um, basically it's fiber, a fiber optic cable on steroids. And that's what's going to be coming out within the next 10 years. What do you think of that? Wait. What do, you, wow. what do you think that What do you think that means? I mean, are we talking about the, the transfer of information is like real time? Um, actually, it has to do with the transmission of specific information more effectively. In other words, certain um, certain information, all depending how it's optically modulated doesn't get transferred. It has to be attuned to a specific frequency in order to get it in, to transmit it at that level. Exactly, because you, know, there's a, you have absorption and reflection, transmission, right. you know, diffusion, diffraction, refraction, all that good stuff, all depending on what the material is made of. But, um, but, uh, is it possible to find the material which could specifically attune to the human body in order to transmit um, information to the human body in a higher capacity? Um, I believe it's already being done. Um, on I do too. That's years. why I have. <laughs> yeah, it's already being done. And we'll collaborate that. Yeah, talk about that. The the, um, the avenue for which it is allowing the facilitation of that to occur is the uh, nanotech that I was uh, discussing earlier. That everybody is breathing in all the systemic nanotech that everybody is breathing in that are being deployed in the chemtrails that everybody has been exposed to against their will, um, there's pretty much no escape of it. Uh, unless you were 
to uh, you know live live out the rest of your life inside of a um, you know class 1000 clean room where all you know particulate matter and all foreign matter other than air itself is introduced into the room I mean anything sort of that you're pretty much done for it you know and um, it scares the hell out of me whenever I think about it but I know there's nothing I can do about it for the most part because I don't have a clean room or access to one although I have um, a lot of experience working in them and um, you know a lot of the um, equipment that they use in um, clean rooms for manufacture of microchips and um, digital circuitry and some light emitting diodes and such uh, you know, I was the one who got drafted to um, repair this kind of technology and it's just something I just innately know how to do <laughs> and it was fun it was fun at the time and um, it was right before I was a TI and then once I became a TI and ended up losing my job and all that and now I'm just you know struggling to survive <laughs> But I still have a good circle of friends that are helping me out, so so to speak. But even then, they they still um, you know question my uh, my sanity. <laughs> and I, I I go okay, well I, I know you you're going to wake up someday, but I'm not going to try to wake you up now because I know it's a futile effort. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, and that's, that's why we're all finding each other so that you don't have to think you're crazy and we all understand each other. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not crazy, but I'm trying to convince anybody else of that. It's pretty hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. I'm kind of. Been... I'm kind of at the point. I don't really care what anybody thinks about me. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. <laughs> wow. I just know that these conversations are very interesting, intriguing, and I, I enjoy them immensely. <laughs> no, I I love conversing about this type of stuff. This this kind of esoteric material is not something I get to touch on it uh, on a regular basis for anyone. <laughs> and I just put this way, I barely even I don't even think I really did scratch the surface. I mean I could go on in depth about all kinds of stuff. Whatever subjects you discuss, I I know I could add to it. And I'd be happy to. Well then if there's anything like you want to touch on that we could really go into great depth on, um, at another time, we could just focus on a particular subject. Is there any particular subject that you know you want to focus on that we could plan a future call? Um, well, I can't think of any one subject per se because there's so many of so many different subjects I would love to touch on. You know, everything from what what God's shape is to uh, how to electronically produce a gravitational field. <laughs> um, I, I could you know be brief about those two things though. Um, well that's fascinating was, stuff. Yeah, we've kind of been all over the board tonight with people and I think that that's good. Um, to oh, kind of get a comprehensive view and take these things into account. Yeah, it's important. Well, you know, think of um, what's the most basic shape in the entire universe, whether it's on the quantum level or the cosmic level. No matter how big it is or how small it is perspective wise. What is the most basic fundamental shape? A line? Mm, not exactly. A line, I mean, if it was a shape, That's then I would say probably, shape. Well, I you think know. A circle. I think circle. I think circle, you do. Do. Let's see, a circle or a, a disc or um, a, you know, a, a, a plate, you know, a circle. That's two-dimensional. Think of a 3D. What's a 3D circle? A sphere. Exactly. Sphere, yeah. Exactly. Now, the sphere seems to be a constant, no matter where you go in this universe. Everything on the atomic level, the subatomic level, to the planetary level, to the celestial level. It's all about a sphere. Isn't that interesting? That seems to be, to, to me, the the adhoration of energy to a scalar wave. You know, it seems a scalar wave seems to materialize the sphere. No, um, I mean it doesn't um, seem to do it on its own. It's fascinating too. Um, you know, when we you know when we put the dodecahedron, for example, over a sphere. Um, you know, Richard Hoagland and Wilcock and these other guys have gotten into this stuff, and certainly some of their research is valid. Um, you know, the 19.5 phenomenon is a very interesting one to touch on. It certainly shouldn't be slipped into the rug regardless of who brought it to us. 
And that is simply when we look at these dodecahedron patterns, which is kind of, you know, ten octagonal shapes, which right. are superimposed over a sphere, for example, and they have, you know, this is where the ley line concept comes from. And we see very tangible, excuse me, tangible evidence of this um, in our physical environment with the, the monolithic uh, structures and, and, the, and the pyramidal structures that are built atop these areas and the chapels and such, even even you know key governmental buildings at this time in the, in the United States and abroad are also um, placed on these points of energy. Um, yes, the ley lines you know, of these. Absolutely, and you know we see Olympus Mons is one of the phenomena of 19.5 in our solar system, which is the largest volcano, which is found on Mars. Um, we have the storm of Jupiter. We have Hawaii here on Earth. All of these things have anomalies at 19.5, and that really suggests that we have some type of a larger scalar wave which in turn materializes matter through its vibratory force which kind of allows matter to come into existence. Interesting. That's interesting. Well, being in a holographic universe, if you will, and being in a, you know, what I call a com you know, computerized or computer-controlled matrix or matrices, either way, it leads me to, um, you know, I was just postulating this just now, you mentioned the, you know, the decahedron. What would a sphere be if you were to digitize it into a decahedron or some other similar shape, right? You take a sphere that doesn't have pixelation or any kind of uh, triangulation um, artifact. It's smooth, but you digitize anything like that where you have to, um, you know, you, you have to resolve it with some kind of, um, you know, mathematical code. And all depending on how complex the mathematical code is depends on the... Um, complexity of the facets of the structure that you're trying to emulate digitally. Now, try to emulate a sphere digitally is never, ever, ever going to be a sphere, ever. It's always going to have facets. But the smaller the facets, the more facets there are. It just means the more complex the code of, of uh, digitization and emulation. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that's interesting. I think that there's a lot of room there for discussion. I think that we could go on yeah. about that for you know, quite a time. Uh, I, what, from your perspective, how, well, to, to be able to counteract these things, if there's one thing that we could do collectively right now, be it removal of fluoride or electromagnetic energy or any of these types of issues, what in your mind is that issue and, and how are we going to resolve that? Well. I, I, um, I would propose what should be done on a group a group level in a, in a group effort fashion. Basically what I do, um, what I've been doing for, for, for as long as I've known, I mean, for as long as I've known about fluoride and all that stuff, for, which is several decades, I um, totally eliminate fluoride from, you know, at whatever cost, you know, from, I don't, I don't ever drink tap water, I shun tap water. I mean, I don't even really like to bathe in it, but I have to. But, um, Tap water is something I completely avoid. I mean, I'd rather die of thirst than you know drink that stuff. And um, on top of that, what I have had to do ever since I've been um, getting attacked by you know microwave radiation and um, all this other malevolent technology, what I call black tech, I call it black tech because it's you know it's all based on um, you know evil and for evil intent. I mean, technology is neutral, but when you apply it towards evil, then it becomes black tech. And that's what that voice is called technology and all that other stuff that um, is being used, you know, to, to um, hurt people. That's all what I call black tech. And what I've had to do to um, shield myself from it is I got this um, military-grade radar reflective type of sheeting that, that's used to seal military technology for shipping. It comes in rolls. And I was able to procure a bunch of it and make my own. You know, I, I have my bed made with it. I, I, I took a, um, a sheet of this stuff, put it all together. It goes beneath my bottom sheet, and then I take an, another sheet of it, and I sleep with that on top, with the, with the blanket either underneath or on top of it. And on top of that, I have a, um, a, head, a head helmet. You know, the, um, basically it's a, you know, the full full head mask that I made out of the same material that um, I swear I've heard the um, the the, the, um, the voice to skull perpetrators 
would be like, they're sc he's scrambling our remote neural monitoring, he's scrambling it, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I'm, I'm certain of it. When I do what I just described, the remote neural monitoring has little to no effect. And what reinforces my entire um, belief system that this stuff is actually working for me is if I don't have this stuff available, I can't sleep. But if I shield myself electromagnetically, I'm able to sleep. And my sleep patterns have never been more, more disturbed than they have been in the past few years. Um, but th this um, type of material, it comes in rolls, and it's, it's um, designated, this designation is MIL-B as in beta, dash 131H as in hotel. And it's called Type 1, Class 1, Ludlow Corporation, Laminating and Coating Division, Marv Seal 360. And this is just what's used for shipping military technology so that that way it doesn't get damaged by, you know, say a radar tower or some other, um, you know, radio frequency transmitter. And I decided to make my bedding with this stuff, and I think it works great. But I recommend that everybody does that. One more time, I'm going to type this out so I can pull it up right now and put it up on our, um, our web page. M-I-L okay. dash... B as in beta dash 131H as in hotel. Okay, class one, right? Uh, type one, class one. Ty type one, let's see. And then, okay, I see. MILB dash 131 rolls. So there's an, an A, it, there's a place that you can get it, I guess? Where can we no, buy exactly. it, actually? I don't know who the vendor is, and I never really tried to look for it myself because I just had it available from the place I work because that's what they do is you know, ship this, the stuff in, wrapped in this material. Okay, but, you know, I found it. All military packaging supplies is a place that you could get it. There you so, go. Yeah, it's not that expensive. Um, it's like a foil. Yes, right? exactly. It's like a, it's a laminated um, type of... Um, um, you know, plastic polymer, um, like a cellophane that's uh, aluminumized, like basically aluminumized cellophane, but it's thick. Okay. I'll put this on our website um, so that we, we actually had something up there about paint, a certain type of paint that people could buy. Um, right. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware of this paint. I'm, that's, I, can, I can actually say that this one, that's one of the materials I would use for um, projects that I was contracted for DARPA for, this paint. Okay. It's a um, it's a specialized type of um, I believe it's conductive polymer based with um, copper nanoparticles. It's impregnated with copper nanoparticles. It looks like you know like copper colored paint that's all sparkly, and it really has a nasty noxious chemical smell to it because of all the you know solvents like the um, there's a lot of um, you know toluene and you know tetrahydrofuran and all kinds of weird crazy stuff in there, but that's, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is the fact that it contains metal nanoparticles. That is um, that, that's key in reflection and absorption of um, high frequency radiation. If you were to take that material and paint your walls with it, and then let it dry, and then just overpaint it with regular paint, you're not going to know it's there. <laughs> it's going to work great, though. Yeah, we have a, um, it's called High Frequency Shielding Paint. Right. And it says that it, um, it's a water-based paint for walls, ceilings, doors, and other interior, exterior surfaces for blocking cell phone signals, CB, TV, AM, FM, radio frequency radiation, and microwave. Um, tested highly effective up to 18 gigahertz based on high-quality pure acrylic binder, this shielding paint offers a... Hey, anyway, that, that's something we have up there already, so I'm going to put this yeah. next to it just for there you um, go. shielding. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Excellent. You, you know, um, also, I believe that uh, the, um, the efficiency for higher frequencies can be um, incorporated. It can be... Uh, you can increase the efficiency of that paint if it were to um, actually also contain um, I believe um, you know, ferrite dust, which is um, you know um, 
allotropic alpha iron. You know, that's what ferrite is. It's uh, allotropic alpha iron. And um, you have dust made up of ferrite dust in the paint also. But on top of that, having what are called carbon nanotubes. You ever heard of carbon nanotubes, Eugene? Absolutely. I've done, done yeah. quite a bit of research into them. Um, there, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting how all this stuff works. I mean, it's so, well, we, you know, go ahead. And, what, what were you going to say about them? Hmm. Okay. Um, there's this material that is called Aquadag. A-Q-U-A dash D-A-G. And it's used for... Um, you know, the, the corona is called corona dope or um, anti-static anti -static paint, which is used for uh, nuclear instrumentation for the um, you know the, the high voltage power supplies for supplying the uh, photomultiplier tubes and the um, the Geiger Mueller tubes. You have to um, coat the uh, the chassis with this material so that you don't get any kind of um, background glitches and such. But it's also the same material that they paint onto. Um, the um, the old um, old style television cathode ray tubes so that it minimizes coronal discharge because the uh, high frequency flyback transformer the high frequency power supply that's used to drive the tube you know it's in excess of 25 kilovolts it roughly you know I, I think it's 18.385 or something like that 18.3 kilohertz nearly this um, aquadag paint as far as I know, it only contains graphite um, nanoparticles, but that would do. If you were to apply this, um, this uh, paint with the metal in it, you know, the metal nanoparticle paint, let it dry, and then coat it with the Aquadag, which has the uh, carbon in it, it would increase the efficiency and the, um, the, um, its uh, bandwidth for uh, reflection and absorption, it would probably take it up to about 100 gigahertz. But um, if you were to put, if, if you were to replace the graphite with carbon nanotubes, I haven't um, really done my research trying, trying to find carbon nanotube-based paint. But if carbon nanotubes were part of the equation, it could take it up to about 300 or more gigahertz. And a, a lot of the um, high frequency radiation, as far as, you know, radio frequency radiation in the super high frequency range that we're experiencing is actually a result of constructive interference and in harmonics thereof. You see that, that um, a lot of the um, high frequencies that we're experiencing in, in um, the realm of what is called scalar radiation is a lot of it's the net result of um, constructive interference Basically, you take um, you know two microwave sources, saying like the um, you know 10.245 gigahertz, which is um, at least X band radar, you know, the same band that um, police use for um, the radar gun, and it's also the same band that's used for um, you know the automatic doors on top of the supermarket. There, the sensor on top of the, um, the doors that sends you when you walk up to it, and the doors automatically open. That's X band radar, 10.245 gigahertz. But if you were to take two emitters at that frequency and shine them in the same exact location and you have them phase matched in such a way that you get constructive interference. You can generate harmonics that are multiples of that frequency. And that's that's exactly what I think is actually being done because the atmospheric absorption at those frequencies is really high. You're not going to be able to take a, a satellite based emitter that's in the, in the T wave region, and then try to broadcast that down to the surface. It'll get absorbed within like a mile of the atmosphere. But you can work around that and create that that frequency by generating constructive interference harmonics from multiple lower frequency emitters coinciding at the same point in time space or space time. You, you have you, you say you're being bombarded from three different point sources of lower frequency radiation, which manifests as um, higher frequency radiation in your vicinity. That, I believe, is part of what's going on. Interesting, huh? Yeah, it really is. Um, 
endless the applications with all this kind of stuff. It's just so yeah. mind-boggling where all this is leading to. It, it kind of makes you wonder how we're ever going to get out of this mess. I, you know, I really just feel like that a human organic sense of intention will overcome all these technological things that are encroaching upon us, and that's where I put my faith every day and choose to put action behind, you know? I, I try to put my faith there, too, but I, given my understanding and you know, my level of understanding of technology, it's very powerful. And as far as truth goes, it's true. Technology is true, you know? I mean, you know, 10.245 gigahertz is still 10.25 gigahertz, no matter where you are in this universe. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it's being, you know, it was, the technology is being used for completely wrong reasons. I mean, you know, um, Aaron Alexis, right? He, um, you know, he shot the, the naval base yard there a few months back, right? That guy. And you know, everybody I talk to about him says, "Oh, he's just some crazy guy." Whatever. I know the truth is that he was being electronically harassed, and um, he uh, ended up um, cracking. That's 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 exactly the term. That's the purpose and handlers use when they're using that technology against you. I mean, I've actually heard um, one of the perp handlers behind my window one time before all this stuff started taking place, and I actually heard footsteps to my back window, and I heard him voice in a whisper, his head is going to crack. I like the sound of that. And that, that really freaked me out. At, at the time, I didn't know what meant by it. Now I do. But uh, the, the, um, the establishment calls that cracking, the person's head cracking when they succeed in their mind control efforts. So there's that. But uh, Aaron Alexis, he was, um, he was victimized by this technology. And um, I don't know if he cracked or not, but either way, um, he, uh, he flipped out and he carved on his weapon, my ELF weapon, and that's one of the misconceptions I wanted to clear up. Right, 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 right here tonight. It reminds me, yeah. One of the misconceptions that's been uh, going on all over the place is that uh, everybody's saying it's ELF this, ELF that. It's not exactly true. The um, Harp Antenna Array up in Alaska there, it um, produces like extremely low frequency ELF, which is somewhere in the order of um, you know, decimal points of hertz to about maybe no more than 20 hertz. It's, it's in the uh, you know, sub-audible infrasonic region you know, of uh, oscillation. But something I heard on the radio totally sparked me as far as going, oh, that's what's going on. Somebody took a uh, receiver that received this lower frequency radiation and he recorded it with an audio recorder. And you know, you obviously can't hear it if you if you actually demodulate it and, and pull the envelope out of the modulated signal at that frequency, you're not going to hear it, even if there is something in there. Unless what this person did, he took the the, uh, the tape that would, had this thing, this audio signal recorded on it, and he fast forwarded it. When he fast forwarded it, it sounded like digitized computer data. You know, like R2-D2, it sounded like that. But you could only hear it when he was playing it in a fast-forward fashion. So there's that. What would you say the purpose of that is? I mean, how, how does that affect us from your perspective? Well, see, um, neurological frequencies, you know, the, the firing of the neurons and such, is low frequency. The human brain and, you know, and, you know the nervous system and all other... Um, creatures, for that matter, it's a very low frequency. I mean, somewhere in the order of, you know, maybe, you know, 6 hertz to 12 hertz. And, um, well, what they found was is, uh, is the correlation between the, the, the brainwave patterns of the human organism and other organisms on this planet with what's known yeah. as the human movements. Uh, 7.83 hertz is largely, you know, what was operating program or software type software for our consciousness because it's literally what the planet itself was generating. That's the resonant frequency of our planet. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, the, um, the low frequency radiation has a 
direct impact on the human um, emotional state. You can induce fear, anxiety, paranoia, happiness, what have you. If you bombard somebody with these low frequency electromagnetic signals, but what's really going on is that on top of gigahertz signals being modulated in a low frequency fashion. See, there's ELF going on. You know, that's strictly ELF. And then this the strictly ELF is being modulated, and the um, cover story is being used to uh, transmit teletype between the submarines. You know, the um, submarines underneath the ocean, because those are the only frequencies that can you know travel through rock and penetrate you know through the um, through the depths of the oceans from one side of the planet to the other. But it's really low frequency, so it takes a long time for you to transmit any significant amount of data. But what's going on is that plus gigahertz frequencies with the constructive interference phenomenon taking place to create higher frequencies, but the same thing is going on to create lower frequencies as well. If you have destructive interference going on that stays modulated in such a way with high frequency radiation in the gigahertz range, you can actually create ELF harmonics that are, say, 8 to 12 hertz. And, um, and, 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 and um, you know, the cycle timing, but really the origin of that, um, that uh, kind of signal is gigahertz type of stuff. So there's several different modes of transmitting the exact same frequency, that, and they're all being exploited at the same time for the same purposes on many levels. Fascinating but scary. Interesting so far. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that you know sometimes we wrestle with the fact that you know I don't ever want to seem condescending even to my thoughts towards somebody else. I try to alleviate judgmental biases that I may have or that I may formulate, but it's hard to think that sometimes this stuff is too heavy for this for the public and I, and I don't say that lightly and it's not something that I like to consider and that like yeah, that I, I, I feel like we could all assimilate this information and transfigure it into something that's a solution and get it done um, and I think that we're, we're we're continuing to see that but you know when we get back you know just for you know if we could get one thing out of here I would like to see fluoridation go. Um, I feel like it's that important. Um, electromagnetic energy, obviously, is that important. I mean, everything is ultimately kind of on. Certainly, things are expressed on an electromagnetic, um, it just expressed in the, in the nature of electromagnetics and electromagnetism in the body and throughout the, the, the environment that we're in. And it really seems to be a large correlation there with the healing of illness and even these nanoparticulates like we were talking about earlier that get into the body that become systemic. Um, you know, one way in which I see that being able to be cured in essence is simply with some type of a the the, the opposite, attune it to, to the polar opposite of an electromagnetic energy somehow or sound to somehow it seems like the secrets are somehow in those things to me. It always has to go back to sound and what's magnetism. Well, it's just... I'm sorry, that's, that's exactly what I was going to touch on. Continue. Well, that's really I, all I, I wanted to say. I, I, I wanted to yeah. make a point real quick before you went, carry on with that, Eugene. Um, what, a, a former electronic warfare officer that was on the air with us a couple of months ago um, expanded upon that and said that the human voice as the strongest um, effect on DNA, at a DNA level. So sound is a very, very profound, um, it has very profound implications at a DNA level. And you guys can take that from there. Indeed it does. Um, that's the one thing I wanted to touch on as far as you know, forms of radiation go. There's um, a form of radiation that many do not consider but it's just as bad and just as good, all depending on how it's used. But um, sonic radiation, you know, infrasound and ultrasound, can have a significant and dramatic, profound effect on tissue, on the neuro, you know, on ne ne neurological function, 
and it can even kill. If you were to take somebody and um, you know choose them as a subject, and you had um, infrasonic emitters or emitters that would create infrasonic resonance during destructive interference or constructive interference, whatever the case is. If you had uh, the test subject in the midst of that kind of energy, and it has to exceed, you know, somewhere along the order of maybe 100 decibels, you know, it's got to be kind of loud, relatively speaking. At, at that frequency and at that um, amplitude, you can stop somebody's heart, make them have seizures, all kinds of stuff, because um, it um, creates um, you know, ripples and resonances within the human body itself, which, uh, you know, blood has a hard time flowing and, and so on. And um, that was um, one of the uh, forms of technology that was accidentally discovered by, I believe it was a group of Russian scientists. They were um, experimenting with um, with sound having to, you know, something, something having to do with sound. I'm not um, familiar with the whole story. But it was an accidental discovery that they made with this little, um, this little box that was producing um, infrasound. You know, infrasound is the opposite of ultrasound. But this infrasound, and they couldn't hear it. But um, for some reason, they, they, you know, they said for some reason that um, they were um, starting to become, they were, they were feeling very ill, very anxious, and they felt like they were going to pass out. And then they turned the machine off, and then everything was fine. And then at, just right after that, the entire project went into the black realm. And now that's what's being used also. On top of the ELF and the, the SHF, the super high frequency, is uh, sonic, you know, infrasonic and ultrasonic. And I actually have a um, an app here on the um, on the iPhone. Here. Um, let me see if I can pull it up for you real quick. Um, I believe it's called uh, Sound Spectrum. Let me confirm that. Um, Oh, it's called Spectrum View. The app is called Spectrum View. And you have to go into the app and change the, the parameters of it so that the refresh rate is the highest and the, um, the bandwidth of it is the highest. And it seems kind of weird to me that um, no matter where I go, the, um, the, 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 the indicator for the uh, sonic spectrum has two um, discrete anomalies, as I call them. Uh, I still have a lot of trouble trying to figure out why, why in the heck they did that. But between the um, the frequencies of, um, oh, I got to change the app. Hold on, stand by, please. I got to change the, the parametric here. I got to increase the uh, the FFT frames average to maximum, the audio sample rate to maximum, and then there we go. And, okay, let's see here. Um, it's not registering right now because I'm on the phone. <laughs> oh, well, 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 well get at it. There's 10, um, 18 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz. It's like a dead zone, as if the, um, the uh, software was um, programmed to reject that, that particular bandwidth. And... I find it extremely coincidental that they would do that because um, the um, frequencies of the um, television um, cathode ray flyback transformer power supply fall within that range. It's that you know, really high-pitched you know, um, ringing that you hear coming from computer monitors and such. That sound that I'm referring to there, um, I believe that that sound can be responsible for um, mood alteration to lower somebody's um, alpha uh, alpha wave patterns in their brain to make them more receptive to the uh, what I call the MK box, the mind control box in television. But um, yeah, that, that um, frequency is one of the things that's causing um, a person to um, be more receptive to that, uh, to that kind of influence. But um, if I was to go anywhere um, outside or wherever away from all this stuff, there's also right around somewhere like around 20, like 22, 21, 22 kilohertz, which is right above the audio threshold for humans. If you were to take, say, 22 kilohertz oscillator and crank it up to, say, 120 decibels, 
and point that at somebody, they're not going to hear anything. But what would happen is they'd start feeling an extreme um, pain running down their neck on both sides, from their ear all the way down to their shoulder. And it feels like pressure and um, like like pr like pressure and aching pain, and that's all due to um, the um, ultrasonic signals that can be um, transmitted. And um, I believe there's a whole big realm of um, experimentation going on in the sonic range, you know, the infrasonic and the ultrasonic range as well. Um, for example, you, you ever heard about those uh, trumpets? They say you know, Gabriel's trumpet being um, heard all over the planet in different areas. You, you heard about that? Like yeah, there have, been a there have been a lot of different um, you know, ideas about what that technology had been. Some had said that it was the fan and ventilation systems from the deep underground military bases, and you've heard all these different things, but is this a type of mind control technology? It was certainly one of those possibilities, yeah. Exactly. But um, you, you know um, Taos, New Mexico, right? The, um, ever heard of the Taos hum, or they call it the Kokomo hum? And it sounds like a... Um, a diesel engine running in the background somewhere, but nobody could localize its its origin. It's like everybody can hear this really low pitch, you know, rumbling like a diesel engine or something in the distance, but nobody could ever localize where it's coming from. I believe that um, part of um, mood alteration, um, mind control type of uh, technology that's being uh, that's being uh, broadcasted from beneath the surface because low frequencies like that can travel through rock, no problem. If you had an um, infrasonic emitter buried, say, five miles below the ground, and you cranked it up to, say, 130 decibels down there, it would make it all the way up to the surface, somewhat attenuated, but still significant enough to have an effect on the surface. And what I've heard, because I've talked to some professors of mine that would um, confirm that these experiments are going on, what they were told, as far as I know, is that it was um, a pneumatic um, type of device that used, um, you know, baffled diaphragms that would resonate at a really low frequency below the audio threshold of human hearing. See, um, the audio threshold of human hearing on the lower end is like 20 hertz. Anything below like 20 hertz, you can't hear it. So if it's broadcasting um, a... Um, sonic resonance of, say, um, 12 hertz at a really high amplitude. You're not going to hear anything. You might feel it, though. You, you can feel it in your, um, in your abdominal cavity, in your chest cavity. But what I've heard that this stuff is being used for is they phase modulate it and transmit data from uh, point A to point B through the air for the same exact reasons that they're using ELF to transmit data from point A to point B through the Earth. The same exact idea, still low frequency, but one is sound and the other is electromagnetic radiation, but it has a, you know, the same idea exists. I mean, refraction and um, diffraction and all that, it, it occurs no matter what kind of wave you're using, it's all waves. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Interesting, huh? What, what do you think of that, fellas? Yeah, there's just so I, much. I, what do you think, Kev? I just had a quick question when you were talking about the um, the neck area being like right. really stressed out. I have that a lot. I don't have stress, but yet I feel like I have this, this constant, you know, targeting of my neck and my shoulders. Is it a guys, I do too, and I'll just sort of throw this in there, guys. It's very, you know, I have pulled so many documents to suggest this is the case. Um, I have put videos up. I mean, well, anytime we see, for example, you know, the Columbia experiments, a video I've done, um, and it, it shows a series of, of metal strips which are encased in a nanofibrous material that's situated at the top of a key neural interface point at the top of the spine, which is you know, incorporated into our clothing, guys. And, you know, oftentimes, I believe this to be incorporated into the threading of our clothing 
and I want to be very specific and on record about this because I think that it's very rudimentary concepts which with what we're dealing here and it is really just one plus one equals two. I don't say, you know, mind control is dismissed because of its effectiveness because I think it sounds pretty. I think that it's true, it's globally implemented. And we're dealing with mind and behavior control technologies here. And one of the ways in which they do that is they place these types of things which interact with the different nanoparticulates and heavy metals and things in our bodies on these key neural interface points and largely along our spine, which we find in the tagging of our clothing. And the shirts that we are wearing literally have these types of nano threadings. And we go and look at the documents, the North Face, um, Columbia, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, Polo, all these guys have invested all this money in RFID and nano technology. And there is no question about this. We see this throughout. And you know, I've got the documents that show they can incorporate threading into your clothes to read your heart rate to monitor and alter your, 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 your different functions in your body. It's, a, it's not just some patent that's out there on the shelf. This type of technology right now is being incorporated into soldier uniforms and, and other types of industrial applications for people like that when they're, you know, perhaps they're going on a, on a diving expedition or, or all these other different possibilities here. The bottom line is that they have this type of technology and they're incorporating it into everything without our consent. And yeah. I feel that around my neck all the time. Sometimes it'll be in the muscles or whatever, but it's like, it's like a leash that these guys put us in. And and it's it's a it's a it's a crazy thing to wake up from. It's kinda of like waking up in that bubble in the matrix and getting unplugged and sucked down the tube. And, and you know, you wake up into this whole world of like, my God, what the hell is going on around me? Um you know, we can break this thing down. We can break this system down with our intention, with our belief. I mean, there's no way that this artificial, they just they can't handle it. I believe that's why we saw this NSA meltdown. Um, and I, I feel like that's the blow to the head of the beast that continues to keep on going in scripture, essentially, is what we're looking at here, is this artificial mainframe. What do you know about the floating structure up there around San Fran um, and what that might be? Google yeah, Earth, about, uh, NSA computer on water. <laughs> I haven't heard about that. Well, it's really interesting. And, and, and the way in which it's able to legally operate, okay, is that it, the, the, the city statutes and the, the statute on the bay there area that mandates that they have to not be able to perform the duties or the or whatever they're actually performing there, whatever... Um, operation is, is able to, to, to transpire has to be able to not be done on land but can only be done on the water. And to think that they would have to somehow be in that parameter and still operating in it makes you really wonder what they're doing with the water. And this is a very large facility that had gained some notoriety and then of course, you know, our media just wants to sweep it under the rug. I mean, let's face it, DARPA is Google now. We have Regina Dugan over there who was the former DARPA, uh, DARPA head. And, you know, She's, a, you know, she's now an executive at Google, um, and we know this to be the AI interface, um, and it works with the they, NSA. They are one in the same. They are one in the same. Google is DARPA. DARPA is Google. Is yeah, the, right. it. I mean, um, one thing I try to tell everybody is, and they don't believe me. They go, "Oh, nobody can do that. How can they do that? There's no way to do that." But I'm like, "Okay, you, you just don't know." But here we go. Everything that is said over the phone lines and everything that's typed into Google and Yahoo and all that stuff, everything, all all communications that are done electronically these days are recorded and archived and put into some server farm somewhere. And every phone call is turned into a text file. You know, everything that we say tonight is turned into a text file and archived in some server farm somewhere. And I try to explain it to people and they just they just don't get it. They go, nobody's going to pay attention to you or listen to what your phone call is. There's millions of phone calls going on at the same time, blah, blah. And they just don't understand the magnitude and, and the gravity and capacity of what technology is. You know, I try to explain it. I, I just get, you know, I get red and blue in the face trying to explain it. So that's why I kind of stop trying to explain it to them because they just don't get it. 
but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm completely familiar with how um, how DARPA and NSA and Google and all those guys do their business as far as everything that we say over the um, electronic community. All right, I just I just did a um, a quick little search on Google mainframe floating thing. They have a second one. Not only do they have one in San Francisco Bay, they also have one in Maine. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now there's two things there's I want to say about There's another Google thing up there, Kim, in, in Maine? This is a main, there's a main bar that's thought to be part of the floating data center project by Google. It looks just like the one in San Francisco. Oh. Now there's two, I two things I want to I I expand upon right here. Two things, okay, the NSA um, one in Utah that does all the, you know, spying on us, they require a, a huge amount of water to cool it while, you know, it's going, doing whatever it's doing. And they put it on this bar. 1.2 million gallons a day, actually, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you put it on water to cool it, okay? And then also water amplifies the effects of whatever this stuff is doing. So th there is something. Now, I didn't know there was a second one. I can elaborate on why and how that is. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> um, okay, first of all, let, let, let me just ask a simple question. People say that don't mix electricity and water. Electricity and water don't mix. Okay, I'm, you know that's pretty uh, basic, but I'm going to elaborate. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to add to that. What do you think would be worse to stand in, a, a, um, a puddle of fresh water or a puddle of salt water? If you're being electrocuted. I don't, I don't know. Salt water, fresh water, as far as its conductive properties? Exactly. Um, salt water is, I can't remember. It's, it's some kind of a trick here. It's like a trick question. I, 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 I want to say that salt water is more conductive, but I don't think that's actually right. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you are correct. Yes. See, when you add an electrolyte, say, um, you know, potassium chloride or, um, you know, aluminum hydroxide, you know, any of those, um, you know, ionic um, chemicals, and you add it into, a, into an aqueous solution, thus creating an electrolytic solution, what ends up happening is you have a material that's darn near as conductive as a metal, but it's liquid. You see, salt water is very conductive. And... I believe they're also using the water as a, um, a cooling media for a very, very, very powerful computational device. And very powerful computational devices produce lots and lots and lots of heat. So you have to have lots of water to, um, to keep it cool. And so they're using the most abundant um, source of coolant available on the water. But they're not putting it on lakes. They're putting it on uh, the oceans, right? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're on the oceans. They're on the okay. oceans, San Francisco okay. and Maine. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. There, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I haven't heard about this until just now, but um, I'm, I'm elaborating on as to why I think they're doing exactly that. Um, first of all, salt water is much much more conductive than fresh water. That's that's um, that's established. Now, there's a phenomenon in electromagnetism as far as you know radio frequency goes. It's called ground planing. Basically, when you have an antenna and you're trying to um, maximize the efficiency of radio wave propagation, it's more effective and more efficient to have what is called a ground plane. In other words, a piece of, um, you know, like a plate of metal underneath your um, antenna. Now, I'm really heavy into ham radio and citizen band and all that stuff, too. And you, you can make a you know, rudimentary but effective antenna we're taking a single uh, dipole antenna, you know, it's frequency matched, so you can have a wave or quarter wave, whatever frequency you're transmitting at. But you maximize the efficiency of its output capability and its um, impedance matching characteristics by adding a ground plane. And a ground plane for a citizen band antenna could be nothing more than a, a stop sign. You know, you take a stop sign and, you know, stick that to the bottom of your antenna, you know, structurally, 
you know, perpendicular to the uh, axis of the antenna itself. And you thus have a ground plane. And that ground plane maximizes the efficiency of the radio wave propagation from the antenna and also increases the, um, the um, match ratio, the impedance match ratio. If you have a one-to-one -one impedance match ratio, that's that's perfect. You know, it's like there's no such thing as a one-to-one -one, um, impedance match, though, because it's, it's theoretically impossible to have that. Just like it's theoretically impossible to have a perfect circle. But um, what I'm getting at is the, uh, the the body of salt water is effectively acting like a huge ground plane, for which maximizes the effectiveness of whatever it is they're broadcasting. And furthermore, the um, the actual, um, you know, the, the physical characteristics of saltwater itself being conductive and, and, and whatnot allow it to be um, reflective in such a way that um, it will allow the waves being transmitted from the transmitter to travel along the surface to the land rather than being carried up into space. It's what's called evanescent wave phenomena. And since uh, the land is, you know, right, right there, you know, coincidental to the um, to the plane of the uh, body of ocean water, the waves are just coming right up here on the shore. Boom! I mean, I'm I'm just picturing all this in my head right now. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like remote viewing it as we speak and just imagining it, simulating all this stuff in my head. Um, um, on top of that, though, the um, the fact of the matter is, being you know, saltwater being as conductive as it is, it also makes an extremely effective electromagnetic radiation shielding. So I'm surmising and postulating that whatever the heart of the, this mechanism is, its Achilles heel is underwater. So if some kind of electromagnetic pulse device was to disable all the electronics, it's my supposition that this device would continue to uh, to live on, so to speak, because it's Achilles heels underwater. It would be thusly shielded from any kind of electromagnetic bombardment. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, that that is really one of the first things that should come to anybody's mind. That is really a good deduction based on the fact that you just got that information. I like that. Um, do you know anything? Wow, that's cool. Um, so yeah, obviously it's a pivotal piece of their infrastructure to run this system, it makes them wonder why it's so important to them. Obviously, it's not just surveillance. I mean, they do it under this guise of, I think all of the stuff of Snowden and all this stuff about it's about surveillance is all just misdirection from what's yeah. actually going on. It's remote neural monitoring, essentially, that's oh, going I get that on. A lot. I get that a lot. Yeah, I mean, and they're blanking this type of technology on millions and millions of people out here. And, you know, what do you know about the old fiber optic, what they would call the backbone, and the key places on that, um, and who initially laid the initial fiber optic network at the onset of that type of technology here on this continent? Well, the actual backbone, uh, is, as far as I know, is the uh, transatlantic fiber optic cabling. That, you know, goes from uh, North America to um, to Europe. That's a transatlantic fiber optic cable. It's it's actual um, you know physical diameters probably no more than maybe uh, four or five inches, and it's mostly insulation. You know, for you know keeping it uh, you know insulated from the elements. But um, that's that's the technical term for a backbone. You know, as far as telecommunications. Okay. I was interested to learn. I actually had a gentleman who had done some work for the NSA and others um, talk to me about a backbone, which I had then researched to come to find out, lo and behold, it was true. Um, Sprint initially was a subsidiary of Southern Pacific Railroad, which is where we got the term Sprint. It's an acronym for something. I, it escapes me right now, but it's you know Southern Pacific something or another. Um, you know, communications technologies or something. And um, <clears throat> there, there's a hub in the Boston area, there's one in Denver, and there's one in the, the San Francisco region. And this was initially laid down um, by Sprint along the right-of-way that they had along these railroad lines where they already had 
the you know the the proper lines in which to lay it. They already owned all the land, and they were able to just lay it there along the tracks. And lo and behold, I, I checked all that out, and it does it does ring true. It is actually a part of our history. And you know, what would happen? You know, if there were a severing of this line, what are the implications of that? You know, potentially globally, what what would happen if there was an interruption there? Well, theoretically speaking, an interruption could very easily occur. All that would need to occur is for some lone diver to go down, you know, say, um, you know, a thousand feet below the uh, below sea level with a with a hacksaw. <laughs> It'd be that simple. Dive down there, find that cable, cut it. Yeah, I had been curious as to how deep that actually would be. I mean, I would think certainly that it would be much less than a thousand feet. Well, the the um, the ocean's depth. Oh, you're talking about an ocean, of course. Oh, yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah. And I and I hadn't researched. I was talking about just the one here that's in this continent. I haven't researched a fiber cable that's gone under underwater. I do know that there is one, but I have researched the other types of cables to some degree that do go under there. And in fact, I've stood atop them. Um, I even have a picture of that. I just found it just the other day. Transcontinental line. Part of it actually runs through Dallas. And, um, you know, I, I forgot where I was going to go with that, guys. I kind of there was something about this fiber system. I don't know. So I guess go ahead and finish up answering that question. I should probably should have jumped in. I mean, just as far as if we were to sever that line, what's going to happen? Well, I think that um, there's probably redundancies in place for the ARPANET. Um, the ARPANET is, was the predecessor of the Internet, but it was military but the ARPANET still does exist. It does. Yeah, and have you heard of the DSN net, the DS net? The DS net, was, uh, it's ARPANET, but there's three classifications with the DS net, and it is, you know, all the really, the different levels of classification and compartmentalization that are encompassed in this DS net, which is, you know, again, the original ARPA, and we found some documents that go back to 1963 in April um, of an intergalactic internet. And then there's also the interplanetary internet documents which we see, which seems to already be operational from the context in which we're taking from these documents. And so when we really look at this 1963 document of the intergalactic internet, as it's called, and you'll see different cover stories and stuff for it, but for them to be talking about the program and software language and all these other things in 1963, really, really, really still continues to raise my eyebrow. It makes me wonder how far this technology back goes back, where does it come from, what's its real purpose, because you know, we're talking about you know, four or five months before Kennedy was assassinated, and these guys are talking about the internet on a interplanetary scale. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of stuff was swept under the rug at that point. Yeah, they were talking about the coupling of man and machine all the way back then, and I'm looking at something in front of me right now about the history of brain manipulation, a document um, I printed today when I was looking for that soul catcher, 2025. And it talks about in 1948, Norbert Weiner published a book, Cybernetic. Okay, they're talking about it in 1948. Right. And, you know, this is why we have to be careful. I mean, it largely seems like the things that become manifest in our reality are ultimately a product of our imagination time and time and time and time again. Um, we exactly. see that. Oh, yeah, I mean, sci-fi is becoming reality all the time around us. It's just a reflection of, um, of people's ideas. I mean, you know, if, for example, you know, a smartphone, you know, like an iPhone. The iPhone surpasses the technology being used in the Star Trek. It's a tricorder. It's a communicator. It's a tracking device, all in one, <laughs> and it's just you know 2014. Imagine what they're going to have in Star Trek time in this timeline. Oh wow! Um, but um, you, ever, you ever heard of a guy? That is, this guy is you know one of the most bravest people I've ever heard of. A guy named Phil Schneider. 
You ever heard of him? I've heard of him. I'm not too familiar with his work. Um, it'd be a good idea to look at, you know, to, to watch um, his um, videos that um, he was um, going to conferences and um, expos before he was uh, suicided. But he was talking all about uh, the deep underground military bases and uh, all of the... Uh, but, uh, yeah, I know Bill Snyder, sure, yeah, he was a good one. He did some great work on the dumps. He really did. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he, was, he was great. <laughs> that guy was awesome, in my opinion. Um, but he said something to the effect that for every six months that technology progresses in the public sector, 30 years, technologically speaking, progresses in the um, industrial yeah, at, at, at minimum, you know, absolutely. You know, we have the guy, I forget, the, his last name is Price. He was one of the, um, you know, an engineer with Skunk Works at um, Lockheed Martin. And right. he, you know, flat out said it when he was drunk one night, basically, and got, they got it on tape where he's saying, you know, that what, you know, anything that we could conceive today has already been done as far as, you know, interstellar travel and these different types of, you know, think of a Rosenberg Bridge or teleporters and all these types of yes. quantum That's technology. True. All that stuff is a reality. Um, and highly classified. You know, we hear stories of these guys having these plasma laptop type devices that didn't have any type of you know, powering needs as far as being plugged in there, you know, as early as the late 60s, for example. And I know a couple of people who would go on record with some stuff like that in their own personal experiences. Um, they use um, zero point technology from Tesla. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, is really what what do you know about the quantum cloud, and, and, and what exactly is that? The quantum cloud or the quantum vacuum? Um, as far as I know, the, um, the quantum cloud or quantum vacuum is basically all of the um, entire universe's energy field that's um, omnipresent. It's an omnipresent um, energy field throughout the entire cosmos. And it is a um, source of, you know, great potential, great power. And I believe it's being harnessed by uh, the wrong people. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what would be, yeah, like more like the quantum vacuum. When I say quantum cloud, I kind of meant like a, a storage field for information. But along the lines of this quantum vacuum while we're here real quickly, um, I think it's very interesting that we see a congruence in the astrophysics and, and other type of communities in that area um, in alignment with what, what the, the the current, you know, consensus is amongst the geneticists and other type of biochemistry. When we look at, you know, the congruence would be, you know, that roughly 97% of our, our universe is made up of this kind of pervasive energy, call it dark energy or a vacuum or whatever you want to think of it as. And that 97% is also reflected in the current consensus amongst the geneticists in that 97% of our DNA is junk DNA. Are we seeing this reflection of our DNA in our environment becomes, you know, something that I really have to consider at that point. I'm actually going to look at okay. that. I think that's fascinating. That really jogs a whole bunch of stuff that I want to touch on now. Um, <laughs> um, as far as junk DNA goes, um, it's not junk DNA. They say that the human genome is 90, like 98, 99 um, percent similar to the chimpanzee. That is complete crap. We are only about like 65 percent um, um, genetically uh, identical to the chimpanzee. The rest of that so-called junk DNA, you know, the rest of the, you know, what makes 100 percent of the DNA is of extraterrestrial origin. See, humanity wasn't wasn't um, wasn't exactly evolved from apes, as they uh, say, you know, evolutionarily speaking. We were, um, you know, so-called hominids or you know, cavemen, so to speak. That were um, we were modified. We, the um, extraterrestrials that came down here. Some people call them the progenitors. Other people call them the archons. Whatever the whatever they are, they came down here and modified early hominids so that that way they could be genetically compatible for breeding. And 
the net result of all that interbreeding and genetic modification is modern human. And um, let's see here. Another thing I want to run well, towards that. I mean, we have natural adaptation and selection. It's a proven thing. I mean, you know, an organism is going to respond to a stimulus in its environment um, and make changes based on that, whether it's a set of gills or any of these other things. But when it comes to men and the human race, we see through an abrupt of a change to not have some type of outside intervention, don't we? I mean, clearly there that, had been some type exactly of... Right. That, that, is, that is exactly on point. I mean, I try to explain that to people that, that uh, you know, have no... It's um, basic to me. I mean, you know... I mean, we hear these arguments between evolutionism and creationism, and to me, it's largely the same thing. I mean, you know, exactly. Uh, that's, that's my that's my theory on the whole thing. That um, evolution is very real, but that's how God created life. And I'll give you an example as to um, what evolution could actually be. The um, the natural background radioactivity and natural background isotopes that are just, you know, present within, um, you know, the soil and the plants and so forth. For example, radioactive potassium. Radioactive potassium, when it transmutes as it decays, the nucleus emits, I believe, an alpha particle and becomes argon. Now imagine if that potassium atom is integral to um, a bio biological reaction where, say, uh, a cell is dividing and a um, potassium ion channel during its um, stimulation, all of a sudden that potassium ion turns into argon, and boom, something else that wasn't supposed to happen does happen, and you end up with a, um, a whole new species. That, I believe, is part of the reason why evolution actually does occur, is because of just natural background radioactivity and the spontaneous... Yeah, mutations. Uh, a, a, a very spontaneous form of evolution, absolutely. Um, exactly. What do you know about the half-lives of different minerals and things and isotopes changing and not being oh. the constant which they had been prior? I mean, this is something oh, that we based have been dating on. For example. You're totally jogging my memory here, too. Um, I learned uh, all kinds of stuff about um, nuclear chemistry and radiochemistry when I was like 12. I mean, I read all kinds of college textbooks on the subject just for fun. <laughs> but um, as far as uh, radioactivity goes, it's my entire theory that it is not a constant. But in fact, the result of the intensity of the neutrino field being produced by our sun and other stars. All stars, they're a thermonuclear reaction. And, you know, it's a wide band transmitter. It's producing and transmitting, uh, you know, forms of electromagnetism on all bands, you know, from extremely low frequency to extremely high frequency and everything in between. But also all forms of particle radiation too. You, you know, you have beta particle output, neutron output, neutrino output, proton output. And um, it's my theory that the neutrino field being produced by our sun is directly responsible for the spontaneous transmutation of unstable nuclei. In other words, if you were to take, say, um, you know, uranium-235, and you go out somewhere where there's not a single star for, say, a billion light years, I mean, you have to go to some point in space where you're beyond, you know, all the galactic clusters, and you can't see any stars or any points of light of any kind. In that particular case, it's my theory that this uh, uranium-235 will still be uranium-235 in a billion years from now. In other words, the uh, neutrino field is directly responsible for the uh, spontaneous decay and transmutation of unstable nuclei. So it's not exactly a constant, but dependent on the neutrino flux of the star. So if you were to take a radioactive isotope that's, um, say, a cesium-137 atomic clock, and it's tuned and calibrated to be, uh, you know, precise to within, you know, one, um, was it one picosecond, or even less than that, like one femtosecond, like one femtosecond accuracy. You would take this atomic clock and go to, uh, you know, some other star system, say uh, Sirius, for example. You go to Sirius star system, a more massive star, 
you know, different neutrino flux and such, I believe that um, that the atomic clock will go faster because the cesium-137 decay rate will have been increased because of it. Well, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, and also, if I'm not mistaken, I think that Sirius is a binary star system. Exactly, uh, there's Sirius A and Sirius B. Sirius right. B is quite one star. But no, that does that really brings up a whole ball of of, of wax here to, to contemplate. I mean, how do these things affect the nature of time from our perception? I mean, how how, how large is uh, to what degree does our perception play a role in our in, in how time plays out in front of us? And what are some of the factors that affect this from your from your point of view? I mean, it sounds like obviously gravity is going to have an effect on time and mass and and, and, and light is constrained, you know, we have the velocity of C here that's kind of constraining everything in this one 3D model, but how do we kind of break free of that? How do we make time something that's more of a, a permeable aspect of our existence? I believe it has to do with, um, well, there's several things. Let me, let me um, touch on a few things here. Um, first of all, I want to briefly touch on dark matter, dark, you know, so-called dark matter, dark energy. You know how a vortex, when you, uh, you, know, you pull the plug out of, a, um, of, your, of your sink, and if you're above or below the equator, uh, you know, it depends on the... Um, Which way it goes down the drain, yeah, clockwise or exactly. clockwise. Right. But the, um, you know, this is the, 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 the center of the vortex that spins faster in the perimeter of the vortex. But on a galactic scale, because, you know, say our Milky Way, for example, it has a supermassive black hole at the center. And the entire um, galaxy is you know, taking on the shape of the vortex. Everything you can is, see you know, it spinning around it, actually, can't you? Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah, it Just is. Like it is. A, I love astronomy, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's great stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and for, you know, the textbook spiral-shaped galaxy pattern in which we are in really shows how that supermassive black hole is just so intrinsic to the development of our galaxy itself. Exactly, uh, and uh, yeah. um, that's what I was, I was going to touch on uh, the next uh, the next round of subject matter. But um, as far as dark dark matter goes, the reason why they postulate its existence, and I can totally see this, that our entire galaxy spins like a record. The center of the vortex spins just as fast as the perimeter of the vortex, like a like an LP record. It's all like locked in place, as if it's all one solid mass spinning rather than being a vortex that's spinning faster in the center. That's, that's already a proven fact. That the galaxy is spinning like, like records. There's, there's that. <laughs> so there's something else, something else influencing the entire mass you know, as a whole that we can't see. And um, you ever heard of a, um, a guy named Al Bielik? Oh, absolutely. You know, my, I'm on public record saying my first memory is sitting in a Montauk chair, so... <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> familiar with Al Bielik, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I, I wholeheartedly believe that we are looking at, you know, to, per his own testimony, he would say that there were millions of children affected by this and largely attributes that to the kidnapping and other things of these children. I would argue that this type of Montauk technology has been refined and implemented globally. I mean, we're seeing these types of devices put on public school grounds, for example, now, where they're literally... <clears throat> You know, they're targeting the consciousness of, of children after indoctrinating them with it in order to broadcast that energy out to have a manifestive effect in the physical and to affect time. I mean, what we learned from those experiments is that mind control equals time control every time. So, yeah, what, what do you have to say about that? Um, um, okay. Um, uh, that reminds me of something else I wanted to touch on as far as um, that goes. Um, the, the, the way that, you know, children are being controlled nowadays with, um, you know, Ritalin and all that other crap. What's, what's going on is the pharmaceutical industry is taking something that's, you know, a normal, you know, psychological condition of a child, you know, kids being kids, and slapping a label on it as an illness or affliction or a syndrome, say ADHD, ADD, and, you know, that's all complete horseshit. You know, they're just kids being kids, and they're, labeling it as an affliction, and then producing a so-called treatment for this so-called affliction. 
that's that's all part of um, you know the grand scheme of mind control, and they're getting them at a young age, so that their um, conscious resonance becomes compromised at a young age. Uh, I, mean, I totally see that. Uh, it's disgusting. Absolutely. I mean, you know, they they assault these children on their diet with the aspartame and other genetically modified foods. Right. You know, now you know aspartame allows the body to assimilate heavy metals to a higher capacity when often we pass them through our body when can take them in conjunction with potassium and other things. When they put this, you know, aspartame specifically allows the body to assimilate these heavy metals and other, you know, even isotopes and stuff into the body. Right. Um, we really need to take a step back and think about that. And, and on top of it all, then they want to indoctrinate them with the curriculum and subjecting yep. to this electromagnetic energy. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. It's the same stuff they were doing in Montauk on a much larger scale, really. MK Extra, exactly. Yeah. I like I that because, you know, we, I wholeheartedly subscribe to the idea that we have seen the MK-type technology blanketed across the public. We, it's just clearly. That's, that's why I call it MK Extra. It makes sense, right? It oh, does. Man. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, well, Al Gielek, what he was talking about um, during the uh, Philadelphia experiment on the USS Eldridge, the uh, three heavy hitters that were responsible for that was um, Albert Einstein and John Van Wyman and Nikola Tesla. And what Nikola Tesla, the, the Al Gielek said that he came up with was something that was called the zero time reference, or zero time point reference generator. The zero point reference, you know, the zero point reference time generator, that, that thing, basically is a phase lock loop, or PLL, that is phase locked to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. In other words, the entire time constant for an entire Milky Way galaxy is solely dependent on that supermassive black hole at the center. And this technology would allow a phase lock in a time domain and a frequency domain, which would allow the, um, the time machine, if you will, to not lose track of where it is, when it is, wherever it may be. So this was to go backwards forward in time and be able to find its way back home. And it's all because of uh, the zero point time reference generator thing that um, Tesla devised. Um, but um, that, that whole thing that um, Al Budic was talking about kind of um, scares me when I think about it. Because he was saying it was like the year 2739 or something. It was, it was like the 28th century that he went to. And he was saying that the, um, the entire world was an utopian society with a population of only 500 million or so. And the entire society was run by an artificial intelligent computer like Skynet and Terminator. And that scares me because yeah, Al he did. And those are some of the accounts where I hear out of Al Billick that are kind of difficult to swallow when really it largely mirrors my uh, everything that I'm reading to now. It's just when you hear about somebody going to the year 2745 or whatever, it's just like, you know, this is too out of the box or, or whatever. But <laughs> the elements of all the stuff that he puts in there really are there. And um, some of his testimony, I would say, is just absolutely spot on. He definitely yeah. had to have been an insider and to know what he was talking about. Yeah. And that, what I'm afraid of is that the New World Order won in that particular timeline. They succeeded in decreasing the world's population to 500 million between then and now. Yeah, I would say that there is, you know, I have certainly had such an apocalyptic worldview in my life um, I certainly know what you mean. There has been a time where I was absolutely, utterly convinced of our, you know, imminent demise, if you would, and just really believe that. And I, I find that having hope and forgiveness, um, and ultimately the fruits of love, if that's what we want to think of them as, in the human perspective, um, has a change. Exercising those things it has a change in my physical environment when this is coupled with the intention of other people who are like-minded and open their hearts to facilitate that energy, it has an even more pronounced effect in the physical environment. And every time we are doing something better right then, it makes it better for the collective. 
It makes it better for the world later on as a whole, our grandkids. And I have to hope in all things today because I, I, I've understood that this is, has enabled me to retain my life force in a physical body. I mean, I can largely attribute my faith and my belief in, 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 the, in the sense of knowing I'm protected, knowing I'm here to do things that are of importance and to work with other people with these things. Um, my faith in that has kept me alive um, in, in the physical to get these things done. I mean, I just wholeheartedly believe that. I mean, I have been through so much stuff in my life, and I'm sure you have too. I mean, you know, you put our family histories out there. I can assure you there's some really interesting stuff going on around our camp. And I would suggest that that's probably the case with yourself as well. I mean, you mentioned some of this stuff. Obviously, if you have such a high mechanical inclination like you you outlined for us in, in your childhood, you have, you know, right there, you were a prime candidate for number one being looked at. Had you had any governmental type people around you of any, you know, of any senior rank, they would probably have known to try to to discern that and see if, you know, they'll put kids like that in a program because of the abilities they have and then try to yeah. continue to use those abilities later on through the mind control trauma and other things. And they'll, they'll, they'll beef these people up psychically, spiritually yeah. in a sense. They are making yeah. a warrior which can operate on that level. Um, and that's what they really... You know what, today. Eugene? And I, I feel like just like me, like, like the abilities that I had were latent and kind of dumbed down till it was time to push, you know, push them to the degree that they need to be now is the same in regards to even though you had those inclinations and intuitions with science at a young age, that look what they did. They pushed you in a program with special needs children. I mean, uh, they, were protecting, yeah. they were protecting you. They were stopping you from getting into programs like MKUltra. Like, same with me. I didn't get pulled into that stuff. And that's why we're having these conversations today. Really. Well, I, I, I have some memories of, I can attest to the fact that I'm probably in my labs because I, I have some memories that um, you know, make me believe that. Um, for example, um, my, I was um, like in a, in a twilight sleep, so to speak. You know, this was like maybe... Uh, like about a year ago or so, and I, I came to for just a moment, and there's this um, type of um, face mask being put over me, and I was just being told to breathe, and it, I was only like conscious for maybe about a quarter of a second, and then knocked right out again, and um, uh, you know, I just think about that, it scared me, <laughs> but um, I think that I have been uh, abducted at least once or twice in my lifetime and um, experiment on or what have you. I mean, I, I seriously believe that I have a clone that's being used to um, target me on the conscious level by my clone having being tormented in some fashion. And the reason why I think that is because a lot of the time when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, I just feel like uh, when I close my eyes and I just let my, let my soul travel, it feels like that um, I'm in some kind of, um, you know, prison or hell or something. That um, it feels like I'm being, um, you know, bound and tortured or something. And it leads me to believe that maybe a clone of mine is being um, abused to get to me somehow. Well, I, I do find that interesting that you would say that because we recently introduced to an individual that was talking about how he was taking to clone centers in his REM sleep and abused. And so yeah. it, it, it's potentially, it, this is a new area of um, understanding for me because I don't have any reference point to that, but interesting that you would um, bring that up. I, I don't have a reference point to that personally. Uh, I, I have so many uh, weird experiences in my life to just you know, discount it all as being coincidence or a manifestation of random neuron firing. <laughs> I, I don't believe that. There's, no, I don't believe there's any such thing as random neuron firing. It's all the result of something, whether internal or external. But there's a, there's a, um, a pattern to it. 
Oh, I absolutely agree, and that's like one of the things that I've been good at being an observer, not necessarily someone who's judging or in, um, you know, connected with an outcome or an egoic kind of perspective. Is that I just look at patterns, 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 patterns. And one of the things I wanted to bring up earlier when you guys were talking about the quantum cloud was you mentioned the omnipresence of the field of potential in this quantum cloud, and I'm not sure if Eugene, um, it's the same quantum cloud that you were referencing to. The thing that came to my mind when you were speaking about that was this quantum cloud is is like the collective free will. And if the collective free will is being manipulated on a large scale, this is part of that whole, you know, mass programming. That's Kim, I think it. I think it's important to make a distinction here. I mean, there was a distinction between, obviously, the quantum vacuum and the quantum cloud not being the same thing. <laughs> we kind of went off into that. But what we're talking about here, you know, when I say that Randy Garrett, who is the current project manager for DARPA, and presumably shadow.darpa.mil from this EECS email log, um, which we have for anybody to review there, which we encourage people to do that. It's such a telling document when we get into those complex systems. Um, you know, we see um, Edward Lee and these other guys. Um, <clears throat> he he comes. Up, he's over. He has oversight of what they call the quantum cloud for the NSA and artificial intelligence. He's on public record with that. Okay, um, and hard pressed to find that information, but it's out there, um, and anybody can confirm that for themselves. We just you know a pretty rudimentary search on, you know, one of the search engines. And this type of quantum cloud is something that is a pool of artificial information that is stored from us via these different satellite and surveillance technologies, smart grid, um, the reading of the resonance signature, tied into some DNA database that we, you know, God knows what it can do, the capabilities. Um, that is really what the quantum cloud is. You know, you hear about the iCloud, where you upload right. your picture to or these other things. And then we would have the organic cloud, which would kind of be our souls, our collective sense of, of individualism expressed through our interconnected nature um, into one mind type thing. And, you know, those two things kind of battling it. And for one, did we have, a, you know, when they manipulate this artificial cloud, it seems to have an outcome or, or a potential target it. They target some aspect of the collective consciousness with this quote, quantum cloud, end quote. It's kind of where I'm like, with, you know. I understand now. Um, it sounds like the quantum cloud is a um, synthetic form of the Akashic Records. Exactly. Good, great, exact, brilliant way. What an analogy, honestly, because, you know, for those who don't know the Akashic Records, it's just kind of like a pool of information that you can tap into about your history. Um, you know, I do. Even the future, I mean. Right. And anything that could possibly happen. Exactly. And so that's why I really feel like we're getting into a sense of artificial timeline generation. Um, I really think you hit that home when you said that. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And what are we going to do with this? I mean, the bottom line is we have this field of information out here which are, they're attempting to road the prize human beings. They've largely been successful at it. Um, yes. And we know this to be the case. And so, you know, they're plugging HARP and other types of devices, including this weaponized communications grid, which we find ourselves surrounded by, the towers and all of these other things, um, are, are clearly interacting with the human consciousness, clearly having a physical outcome because of that. Um, buddy, I'm telling you, we're going to have to break this thing down. Um, and, and largely, we just do that. I think that you have a key to getting this done with the actual monitoring of this stuff and making a proven case because that's what we need. You know, I was on air with a guy who met with the guy who actually developed the synthetic te telepathy technology. Um, and that interview has been swept under the rug for a million different reasons. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is this stuff went black back in like 1981 with the synthetic te uh, telepathy. We already know artificial intelligence was in there. Different rogue intelligence factions as well as the CIA and others 
had come into contact with this type of technology, and this is back in 81, okay? Um, right. We know we're talking 30 years ago. Um, plus, you know, there's been large advances in the technology. I mean, from a from an underground technological standpoint, like your buddy said, it's kind of like Moore's, Moore's Law meets, I don't know what you want to call it. I mean, it's, you know, every six months or whatever, you know, here, you know, Moore's Law is every 18 months we have a leap in technology, yeah. which we're, we're breaking that, but it would be like something like 90 years worth of defense technology at that point being unleashed on the public with different factions at play. And that's really a nasty can of worms to look at. And so it becomes complex. I, you know, there is types of technology out here where people have, I'm telling you, these sheiks out there and these other guys <clears throat> have these slaves that they will steer with people. They'll text it into a device, and that person will carry out the frickin' act. Okay? Yeah. We know that they have this type of technology, and certainly an artificial intelligence could do something much beyond that on a, on a much broader sense. And so just trying to really illustrate that picture is very difficult. And any time we can add a piece of physical proof to this with like what you're talking, it's really what so sparked my interest tonight with this conversation. I mean, we could, you know, we could go on with this for hours. I think that we, amongst us, we, we need to get together with other guests. It's important to share this information. I mean, who do you, who do you look to out there that you hear on the radio or other types of books or any type of, who, who's somebody that you would try to point towards their work as kind of a fundamental in understanding these types of things? Uh, I don't really have any, any single one person that I could reference because a lot of the stuff that I've come to the conclusion of, I just dredged up on my own and pieced it together on my own. It's intuitive ability in someone else, and I think it's also nice for people like us, guys, that when we see this in other people, it gives us a sense of reaffirmation uh, amongst Perfect. the things that we're talking about, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's important yeah. because, you know, what it, you know, we were, we've been on the air with some great people, and the, the underlying real aspect of this is that we can create our own reality. <laughs> as crazy and as outlandish as that sounds, I mean, there are these fundamental things that we are going to adhere to, and it teaches us. Uh, in the parameters of this like, physical existence, what we're here to learn. That's something that we agree to. That's what we're here for. And, you know, while there's a fractal of God within each one of us, from my perspective, I don't think that I am God at any point, and I'm very thankful for that. And I try to mention that as much as I can because I find solace and peace and comfort in the fact that I don't have to make all the decisions out here. And thank God my creative ability is still finite. Um, I'd like to be able to express it in pure love, and I know that when I can, I'll be able to do it fully in order to have the right effect in my environment, you know? I understand. There's so many things going on, though, in, in our physical reality, which prevents us from uh, being able to output love 100% of the time because there's so much uh, negative bombardment and influence attacking us from all angles all the well, time. Well, what do you see happening? I mean, do you feel like we're going to slip off the edge of this thing and, you know, the, there's going to be a, a blow-up at, uh, you know, Yellowstone or the... The, the, the plants are coming in, and they're going to wash over the, the tides over. The, you know, there's going to be mega tsunamis all over the earth. I mean, what's going to happen? Well, I've, I, I try not to think about it, but I, I've had dreams where I'm being chased and attacked and having to hide from uh, automated attack drones. So that too, I would yeah. argue. So I think that we see largely a blanketing of systematic control in the populace through a pulsing type frequency that regulates sleep patterns, eating patterns, habitual things that we do, um, all of these things. People seem to have different susceptibilities to these types of things, whether you know they fall into the trap of certain addictions or whatever they may be suggested to. But you know, we have we have clear evidence that we can create in our environment any placebo study which there's, you know, thousands upon thousands of, where there's been any alleviation of symptoms in a, in a placebo group, you know, you really just had stopped everything right there and says, look, that transcends time. It transcends the basic realm of physics when we really look at it. I mean, we have to look at things on a quantum level at the very least when we get into that. And, of course, you know, the next step after quantum is this plasma physics idea, which is into a whole other ball of wax with time travel and stuff. I mean, obviously, when you have a plasma confinement type of device, you can, you can, you know, very theoretically, you could traverse in time and 
um, certainly there's there's testimony of people out there actually utilizing those types of devices already who have come forth. And so these are all things that we all need to take a look at and try to figure out. Yeah, um, um, I agree. You, you ever heard of um, a technology called reactive camouflage? Um, I've seen a lot of different stuff about invisibility and metamaterials here, particularly lately. Um, and we were actually just talking about this, and so it seems like it's along those lines, but not exactly. No, what is that? Well, it's a uh, it's actually a suit that you wear, like you know, like a, a you know uniform of fatigues, you know, full body suit, really light, and it works off of uh, several technologies. Um, it's the fiber you know, optic, isn't it? Yes, it's 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 a combination of fiber optics, liquid crystal, piezoelectric actuators, and laser emitting diodes. You couple all yeah, the three things, well, all four things together. It's just light around the object in order to make it appear invisible, essentially. Right? This is even less sophisticated than that, but the same idea. Um, basically, the um, the background is projected and emulated as a um, optical photonic projection, all depending on I mean, it's, it's, it's totally independent of vantage point. So no matter how you view this um, cloaked object, it appears invisible because whatever is behind it, no matter how it's being viewed, is being projected on the, on the other side, so it appears <laughs> to not be there. Wow. Yeah, that really breaks down. I would like to research that very much because I'm sure you're familiar with Project Bluebeam. Yes. Um, you know, I would say that we're seeing some type of a system which would ultimately interface with our consciousness again, and we're, essentially we are Project Bluebeam in the sense that we are bringing about these manifestations in the sense that it's very much like what you just described. They're trying, because we have that ability to do similar things like that and to manifest things and to, you know, and make things invisible and kind of a dimensional shift there through the use of holography in a sense to, to change things in our environment. And we can do that organically through the function of our pineal gland. And when we see them trying to mimic that, what the hell are we looking at? I mean, how do we describe that to somebody? <laughs> no, no, a lot of people don't even know what the pineal gland is, let alone does. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, Jesus said it too. Jesus said that if thine eye be single, then thy whole body will be full of light. And when I think about how fiber optic works and light and time and all of these different elements and then, you know, the, the, the piezoelectric nanoparticles that are in our body and our whole body, you know, and then it goes on to say, if the light that is in thee is dark, then thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Um, basically, a paraphrase, it's not word for word there, but that's what it goes on to say. And it seems to be just describing perfectly what I'm looking at out here. Um, with this whole encroachment upon our organic sense of liberty, which is just so, I mean, it's a miracle that we are able to function. I say it on almost every broadcast because I can't get over the fact that we're going over all these things. You know, I'm thinking well, we're going we're gonna to start passing out flyers at schools and talking to parents about electromagnetic energy and fluoride and all these things and really getting with our local officials and stuff like that. It's really, we're gearing up for that right now. And to, to go out and do that um, and, and not seem like lunatic with people is something that's humbling to me. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's one of, what a sign of the times to think that we have to do something like that. But ultimately, I think that, you know, I, I'm confused about how you feel about it, I think, um, as far as your overall sense of, of, of this is an apocryphal thing. Or are we going to pull through this thing? Or how do you view that in the end? I mean, what do you see happening? Honestly, I'm on the fence about it because I can easily visualize either scenario occurring, whether it be um, the AI getting defeated and everything coming to light to the public, or something all of a sudden, boom, just happens, and a lot of people end up uh, you know, succumbing to really bad circumstances really quickly. I can see both scenarios. Yeah, it's so hard <laughs> to be grounded in, you know, this set of values that's organic, I guess, is the way that I try to conceptualize it. It's like, 
you know, is it, I mean, what, all, everything that I'm leading to and what I've learned in my life, in my life, in my set of experience in my life is that I, if I'm creating in my environment, I have that, every time I realize that a little bit more, I have an obligation that's increased to, to adhere to those core value of good organic principles in my life that I think about. If thoughts are things, I need to keep my heart clean in order to put this out there, regardless of what type of barrier is seemingly in front of me because of all of this, you know, deception and lies and what pivots us against one another and the division in the community about just what's right or wrong for us and all this kind of crap. It's just, it's just confusion and it's really simple what I need to do. And so just to keep our hearts clean, I would say, has a profound impact on the physical environment. And I can never get over that. As I can never say that enough because time and time again we'll see it. We'll see it in the Emoto experiments, placebo experiments, or, you know, test studies with galgabinic skin response with plants. And the list goes on. It's amazing what we really find when we look into this. And the flip side of that is there's a whole industry of people that seek to the, keep this information from the public. I have tried to get stuff out to people and then censored over and over and over. And even yourself, you're happy just to talk with somebody tonight. Um, it's time to really open these forms. I mean, how do, is, it, is it important for you to try to engage people? Have you tried to engage people in physical, like, you know, face-to-face -face or you know, in different places? I mean, how does that go for you? No, uh, I get shut out and ostracized every step of the way. I get, you know, I, I've had doors slammed in my face my entire life. I mean, I try to, you know, get a decent job as a job interview, for example, and, you know, I snow the interview, and I talk circles around the, um, the interview, the interviewer, and then they ask the, uh, you know, the, the, they drop the, uh, the E-bomb, as I call it. So what, what education do you have? Uh, where did you go to school? Um, I, I, you know, I, what am I going to do, lie and say, yeah, I went to MIT and Harvard. And I say, yeah, I learned all this stuff on my own, and, um, quite proficient at it and give me a chance that I'd like to prove myself. And uh, essentially, 100% of the time, they tell me to go to hell. <laughs> How comforting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we all find that niche out there somewhere, and it's important to do that. You know, I think that the times that are coming, people are going to understand. I mean, you know, the whole economic situation, <laughs> you know, regardless of what we think, is somehow going to have to come to a head, and it's doing that. I mean, we have a whole system which the commodities aren't really backing it up anymore. I mean, essentially, our money is fake. It's like monopoly money, these guys, and it's all a scam, and, and people are really figuring that out. And, you know, there's global uprising going on, the massive uprisings. It's only, I mean, the media here is so controlled. Um, how do you feel about cell phone towers on public school property? <laughs> um, I don't like the idea at all. You know, cell phone towers being, you know, used for what they're being used for other than, you know, cellular communication and the gigahertz region. They're being used for a lot more than that. But um, there's, there's a few um, different um, testimonials from different sources I have that, you know, we need to, I, I correlate all of it and I, you know, come to the conclusion that there's some, you know, really dark, sinister things going on with cell towers. I heard about... I would say these guys have the ability to target specific ethnic groups through the use of resonant frequency expenditure on the genetic level. Um, the testimony there, it's not testimony. I mean, it's a definitive fact. We've, you know, it's conclusively shown. Certainly the Defense Department and the telecommunications industries are aware that this is the case uh, and this technology is decades old, really. I mean, we there's lots of really well-recorded instances with this in the defense and intelligence communities, for example. And, you know, beyond that, we have the terahertz. Terahertz can see through walls, admittedly. We have the documents. You know, I know a guy that used to know him. I talked to him and did a show with him. And, you know, they, the vibratory pattern says they can see you through the, the, the walls and through the, the ceilings and all these other things. And satellites certainly do have that type of technology. They certainly um, do. I, I try to explain this stuff to people. And they just, I told a couple, couple friends of mine, they don't get it. They say, oh, no, the government wouldn't do that. There's checks and balances in place in the Constitution. And da, 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 da. They, they, you know, they're totally brainwashed. Well, the 
you know, with the, you know, competition. You know what I it's, I find that it's more effective if we chop up these types of interviews into smaller segments, and yeah. perhaps we should look into that. I can go over this stuff and chop some of it up. I do have a guy here now that can help me do that. I just met him recently. And so we've covered so much stuff tonight. Um, I, I, I want to be able to, you know, of course, I always throw off all my stuff out there in raw and just let it be in its entirety. But I also think that maybe we should kind of maybe try to chop this up, even if it's for ourselves as we listen back and try to pick out some of the focal points and make bullet points. Because I think, you know, exactly. I think that you can be your good voice. You have a lot of good information. Um, I can't hear you that great right now. That could just be my phone. A lot of times that comes out in the recording. That you know, it'll, we can bounce it out somehow or something like that. But um, I just want to make some bullet points with you and touch on that stuff for in the future. And you know, I, I need to get blogging and writing about this stuff more too. I think that that has a, more of an effect than I give credence to because I don't do it that much. I'll use my Facebook and stuff. But that's it. And so there's a lot of ways in which we can try to get this information out if we come together. And so. You know, we're a resource here to try to help you do that, and, and hopefully, you know, vice versa, we can establish a working relationship where we can keep getting that done to a to a higher degree. You know, it's all about getting this stuff out and learning as we go and growing as we come into to, to our knowledge of these things. That would be great. Um, I was thinking about doing the very same thing, you know, taking everything that we've been talking about tonight and writing it down on paper and then elaborating on it further in, in an outline fashion. So that way yeah, that's a good idea. Are you on Facebook? I mean, I guess that's how you guys met, isn't it? Right. Yeah, well, like, I don't yesterday, know. like yesterday. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if, because Kim and I work together a lot. Um, we have like 17 projects up, I think, from the website, right, Kim? Yeah, I think we're like almost up to 20 now, so yeah. Okay, well, Kim is so busy on that website, I can't even keep up with her, obviously. Um, and there's always new stuff going up on there. Um, and we're in the process of really putting together some material right now and looking for people who can help with that. I mean, just to have, I mean, a, to have a sense of information. I mean, you, you're, you're pretty well, you're pretty versatile when we, you, know, you talk about, you know, we covered a broad range of topics tonight, and you, and you did an excellent job, I think. It's a good, great guest. So I want to find more of uh, this stuff down on paper, like you said, and and absolutely solidify it. And, you know, it's nice to be with people, around people, that can help you get this done. What, what community are you in? Um, I'm in the um, San Fernando Valley area. Where? The San Fernando Valley. He's just north of L.A. He's in L.A. Uh, area. Okay, okay. Well, there's a lot of people out there who are growing in this movement. We expect to see a lot of growth out of California just because Kim's out there. Um, you know, there's going to be some shit going down, bro. Like we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna fucking go hit these people where it hurts and get this fluoride out of the fucking water. I mean, imagine yeah. if, if, if you know, if we're such creative beings and our pineal gland is doing it all, think if we could help people uncalcify the fucking pineal gland. You know, exactly. just a small shift in this consciousness has a maximal effect when it's done with the right type of energy. You know, fortunately, these lower vibratory energies are as manifestive and they are finite. You can't go, it's just a certain set of parameters which you can experience. And when we get into the higher vibrations, our possibilities become much more, you know, enumerable. Um, there's there's a many more up. I mean, there's so many other things I'd like to talk about, but I'm starting to get, um, you know, starting to get a little tired and stuff. But um, I, I really enjoyed the discussion we had tonight, and I look forward to future discussions. I mean, I only became a, a, a person on Facebook like a month ago, and so many interesting things have happened since then. I've ran into so many interesting people since then. And the reason why I've been off of any of those social working net, um, networking websites there, the reason why I've been avoidant of them for so long is because I was afraid of NSA this and DARPA that. And, and then, you know, just all of a sudden... We have, listen, we have straight up had shills crawl up into our mix and then citizenly, you know, malevolently, evil, just just nasty, derogatory, just 
you know, stuff you wouldn't want to say in public on radio about stuff. Um, you know, try to cover up this information, do everything they can, and really expose themselves in the process. And at the same time, you know, I have found people, I have been on international radio programs. I have gotten to get my message out along with Kim and others. Um, and we are continuing to do that. As far as I'm concerned, that's standing on the sea of glass mingled with fire um, and taking back this system which runs us out of these fiber optics. Ultimately, it's all hooked up to this. Yeah, that's man. right. And playing the harps of God. That's what we're doing right now. Thank you very <laughs> yeah. much. Uh, I mean, like, you know what? We just met yesterday on uh, through a conversation. Eugene and I met through Facebook um, on my birthday, not in 2014, but of uh, 2012, actually. So there is good to this system. And we are breaking down the system that is turned against us. And we're using this exact system to break through the walls and all the veils that have been against us forever. I'd like to get you a copy of, I'd like to send you a link. What's your name again, brother? I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten your name. My name is Richard. Richard, I knew it. I knew it, Richard. Excuse me for that. I'd like to send you some documents about um, this complex systems and other stuff that we're working with, and perhaps you could help us with that. Um, you know, it's a, it's an open source. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the email log I had never heard of it before, and I think that if it's you know people were that, I think that something happened when that document was basically acknowledged and observed because it's just so hitting. I mean, the fact that they used all this stuff in there, you really have to see it for yourself and to get into the complex systems and and understand. You know, we'll, there's a part in the email log. Well, they talk about how they are. They speak in metaphors. These people literally use allegories and analogous wordplay in their presentations and their PowerPoint presentations and all these different ways. There's a method of classification in the document itself, in which you, if you don't read it right, it's just you're not going to get it. It's just going to be on one level, and they literally write it that way on purpose and. These are very intellectual people that we're dealing with, and to really reckon that and to take that into account, man, it doesn't really matter what these other people out here are saying. I mean, you don't want to go off on a tangent, but, man, we're, we're clearly on to something here when we're doing this work. So that's what it, it keeps me going. You know? I, just, I just sent um, a link to you that the a call to actions timeline um, via Facebook message so that you have it. And okay, it's you. not by accident that we find each other, guys, I at all. I know that. Yeah, I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> yeah, I, I, say, I say it has to come out to that resonant frequency of DNA, guys. I, there's no way around it for me to reckon it in, in my head from what I know that, you know, certainly this could happen from an artificial methodology, but I see that happening with the holographic imprintation from our DNA. I, that's just how I feel about it. Um, and it brings people together. This is where the extreme rises to the crop. People come together, and it's kind of like a coagulating form of, of spiritual matter or something, which, you know, becomes cohesive and runs together and just gets it done. It's pretty neat to watch. Mm. No, I think it's a resonance. It's a resonance. It's a frequency oh. resonance. That, yeah. Absolutely. It, very much so. Very much so. Well, um, I'll, you know, I'll find out who you are on Facebook. I'm, I'm a, I have a couple of different personas on Facebook due to the shows. I am the one I will go on air and tell you exactly who he is um, and let you know that on my pages, etc. I don't try to infiltrate anybody surreptitiously or any of these other fucking cockamamie bullshit scams out there. And so... Yeah. Um, I'll find you on there. I have got, I'll just probably send you one from my personal page, just Eugene Sonny Irvin. There's a picture of a lion there. It's like the dude from Narnia or whatever, I think. Um, I didn't realize that when I, I first put it up. I, I, to find I out connected if, you guys yesterday. I think I connected you guys yesterday. I think you're oh, okay, good. Maybe. Good. Um, Very good. Yeah. Good. And we're not here to, like, you know, point fingers at anyone. This is about a collaborative, compassion outreach. Like we're all and we don't want to ever tell anybody what to think. I mean, I'm only going to, if I ever put a spin on anything out here for anybody, it's only trying to say 
what I've experienced in my own experiences, I try to remain objective to hearing new ideas and understanding how they play out for me. Um, and I think we always want to make that clear in our work is that we just want to put puzzle pieces out here and try to ask people to come together and collaborate to help us liberate ourselves for our future, really, is what we're shooting for. Yeah, uh, me too. And, and yeah. I've, I've been feeling alone for so long. And then I got on Facebook and then I was seeing all kinds of targeted individual communities and all kinds of other stuff, and now here we are. <laughs> well, cool. Um, we've got some other interviews out there that we've done. We've done quite a few, um, some of which were actually removed and deleted because we've been, you know, under this. It's really, you know, we, we know that it, the people that we were working with were getting infiltrated and threatened. We have testimony about that even. And so it's pretty nasty out here that these guys want to keep this information from coming out, but maybe we can send you some of those as well. I don't know how many of those are left up on the website. But, um, Whatever you've done, now I'll, I'll take a look at it and, and give my yeah. perspective on it. We're at a different stage now, really, guys. It, it's like we're these conversations um, can't be infiltrated through the systems of a radio network or what have you. Um, this is kind of the way we have to go, raw, organic, to put the stuff out there because otherwise it, it's like there's handlers upon handlers upon handlers and what we experienced, nothing against, you know, anyone that was handled or manipulated. It, it, we, all, we always have compassion for everyone. It, it, it just is, there's a system where Nobody there's layers to. of handling. And, and so therefore, there, there is no handling here. It, it's just raw. This is where we are. This is our conversation. You know, it's almost handling is embedded in our psyche with this blanketed MK technology. I mean, you know, we've become a cannibalistic type society ultimately. And we even have to weed that. You know, if I'm, if I'm being handled, you know, we've had some documents that we go back and review, and it's like something with Sam is right there in the face, and, you know, it's like I'm on my own freaking handler. Why haven't I put these pieces together sooner? Um, and so it's nice to be around people who are driven to get this work done. I just appreciate that in anybody, so thank you guys. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. I'm happy to help. Yeah. And I've been working on this. Uh, are we ready to wrap it up? Is there anything we need to add in on this one? We've been going for so long. Um, um, that's what I'm we're saying. like at, oh, a little over four hours. <laughs> wow. Awesome, guys. I could go, I could go literally call. for that's a, another day. That's a good day. call. Um, <laughs> and I, I, that was really a good call. I mean, it's getting, you know, I've got to go to bed. What, what time zone are you on? Oh, you're on the West Coast. Okay, so we're all on the same time. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, we've got a great guest coming up, Kevin Gailey, or I forget how to pronounce his last name. He's done a lot of work. He's been on some other programs that I've been on as well. Um, and, you know, he's really outspoken about the whole depopulation agenda and all this kind of stuff, too, and he's really kind of a heavy hitter when he gets out. He was kicked out of Oxford completely, um, <laughs> which I kind of like the whole idea of being banned from Oxford for the entirety of one's life, as he puts it. Um, <laughs> I got I'm always pleased to talk to somebody like that. Yeah. Good I stuff, guys. One more time. Okay, Kim, well, what you got, Kim? No, uh, you, you, you were just saying something about getting kicked out of school or something? Yeah, I, I, I was... Oh, no, I was just talking about Kevin. Oh. No, I was talking I about he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was, it was, um, I believe, it was seventh grade. In the seventh grade, I, I um, actually, it was, um, actually, no, ninth grade. Yeah, ninth grade, I got expelled from uh, for cussing. <laughs> I'm not mad at that. I got kicked out of Catholic school in third grade for having a switchblade. <laughs> true story. Uh, it just sounds kind of cool, but it's true. <laughs> My brother gave me a switchblade. And the rest is history, yeah. I guess. Kind of funny, but. Yeah. It's the um, the indoctrinated ones, the indoctrinated ones that um, persecute and control. <laughs> yeah, and it's like they don't even know that they're doing it, man. It's like they just they part of it's part of a slave system. You know, you have to step out of that whole paradigm and exercise a little love on these cats up here to get anywhere. 
I've always been an out yeah. of the box type of person. <laughs> oh, totally relate to that. And I, I, I had like a, the la not the last job, but the job before I and now that I had someone of high hierarchy say, "You have a problem with, um, you know, authority." And I'm like, "No, I have no problem with authority. I have a problem with authority as an agenda, <laughs> an agenda, a negative agenda." <laughs> and I'm gonna speak yeah, exactly. up about that. I have a problem with abuse of authority or overflexion of authority. You know, because authority itself is is um, you know backed up and and couched in um, you know truth and 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 you know good willingness. Then I have no problem with it. But you know, authority is usually used and abused and used to you know, oppress and persecute and control. So that's why that's why I have a problem with it. <laughs> Yes, agreed, 100%. We are all on the same page. So I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, we're working on four hours and ten minutes. You guys wow. are awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, pleasure. Pleasure <laughs> to be with both of you guys, of course, tonight. Um, and always happy to do kind of a spare the moment show, but let's get those bullet points out of here and really you know, try to get it to, 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 to rash it out a little bit. Yeah, I don't want to sound bad when I say that, guys. But um, there's going to be those who are out there who are going to out there who are going to want to tell us um, where we're messing up, and we need to be able to hear those guys. I think that you know it's very important to value our children in that respect. I've learned that in my whole life. That even in these last few days, to think about the reasons why we're doing this and what it means for future generations, and why we want to get this information out, and what really drives us, and to think about its children, to think about the energetic changes that are occurring out there in our universe and how they play out here on Earth, these children that are here now um, and that are going to continue to come have a very strong message, and it comes in succession, and each wave has a whole new set of gifts and talents and ways to express themselves in the physical environment that we have to help be the, the, the lube, I guess, if you will, just to make sure that these joints and everything moves, yeah. you know, um, I mean, smoothly. I understand that. I mean, speaking of, you know, as far as children go, I mean, I, le I le understood something a long time ago about this universe. And it was a phrase coined to me recently that, um, you know, I was explaining how the universe is broken and, you know, how our reality is unfit and how I never have, I never want to have any children of mine because there's, this, this, this universe, is, there's something wrong with it. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not hospitable for any, um, any being to, um, to live in, it. you know, as far as I'm concerned, in my perspective, because um, this universe has too much entropic vector. I call it entropic vector. In other words, the yin and the yang are out of balance because of the fact it's easier to destroy than it is to create. It takes much more effort to you know, to build something and to fix something. But it takes almost no effort to just totally rip it to shit, you know. And because of that, I think that this universe is out of balance, thus unfit. <laughs> and, and being a Libra, as I am, <laughs> October 1st, very, very um, sensitive to imbalance. So I totally get that. Mm -hmm. I hear you there. I mean, I'm, I'm a Scorpio, so I'm, I love to unravel the mysteries and, and what seems to be hidden to many, I'm, it's obvious to me. I have one of those abilities to see what others don't, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I'm a Leo, and I still resonate with the lack of imbalance. I mean, it's so terrible. I just, you know, I just can't believe our energy system and the way that things are so, you know, with the water and the, the consumption of natural resources and stuff is so terribly out of balance. Um, it makes you how we're ever going to wonder to restore these things without having some type of a globally changing event um, to yeah. abruptly put them into doing this. You know, it's, it's difficult to reckon that. But, um, that reminds me of something, that, uh, something very basic that, it was my idea of how global, you know, how, how it's easy to explain away that the fact that global warming is complete bullshit. You want to hear my theory on that? How to explain it away? It's very simple. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. I mean, it looks okay. like we have global cooling coming into effect. Yeah. Um, bear in mind that ultraviolet radiation produces a reaction in the atmosphere that generates ozone. You see, that ozone is just three atoms form of oxygen, O3. Not, you know, instead of O2, it's O3. It's still oxygen, but it's just an allotrope of oxygen, which is um, produced by energetic plasma reactions, say, from uh, a, a plasma discharge like in a lightning bolt, or energetic photonic reactions, say, from ultraviolet radiation. But when you take into account all of the lightning bolts that occur on the planet every day all the time, and all of the UV that's hitting the planet every day all the time, many millions of metric tons of ozone is produced every day day. So the idea that the ozone layer is going away, oh man, I, I just, you know, I, I just find it so, so good. I have never heard that. I have never heard that. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is very interesting. I would like to see that backed up with some hard scientific facts because... Oh, I could very easily that, prove it. If you, if you the, a, um, if you that's a game changer. Like, <laughs> it is, it is, huh? Uh, yeah. I think it's a very, 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 very simple method of doing that and proving it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, you can smell it. You know, it smells kind of like chlorine. You know, ozone has a very unique and yeah. characteristic pungent smell. If you take a, um, a television, you know, the old cathode ray televisions, and this is something I, I did when I was like 12 years old. A lot of things I did when I was 12 for some reason. Um, you take a um, you know the, the magnet wire like number you know number thirty magnet wire kind of wire that's used to wind transformers and motors and electromagnets and such right you take about uh, ten feet of it and you put a, you know you put a tack in, in one in, in a wall on one side of your room and a tack on the other side of your room and you string the magnet wire across you know your room there making an antenna basically a horizontal antenna and then you attach that to the, um, the output of a high-voltage, high-frequency power supply. And you turn it on, and you can observe the wire shaking because of the kernel discharge. You can see kernel discharge, also known as St. Elmo's fire, which looks like a purplish glow. You know, that's the result of high-voltage discharge and the high-potential you know, high potential electric fields interacting with the atmosphere and generating a visible you know, glowing field of plasma. I mean, I've shown people how to, how to make wires glow purple, and they go, whoa, no way. But yeah, you know, mm. I, I even made a very simple Tesla coil using a signal generator, a Darlington transistor network, and an ignition coil. And I can vary the, uh, the frequency of the coil and produce an excess of about 40, 50,000 volts with a 12-volt battery. And you take that device and you put it on this horizontal antenna, and the reason I first made it was to make an air ionizer. You know, people would be partying in my room and whatnot, and it would be all smoky. I'd turn this guy on. 30 seconds later, the air is clear. You know, it causes, you know, the, you know, the electric potentials cause the, all of the... Uh, wow. Of the air and, you know, yeah, that's really neat. <laughs> Thank mm. you. Yeah, wow. I'd like to see that in action. That's pretty cool. Um, I, I, that is really fascinating what you said about this ozone generation. Um, I'm taken aback by that, to be honest with you. I would like to look into that more. I'll tell you what, um, Al Gore is not going to be too happy about that one. <laughs> you know, the whole carbon tax and all this. The, 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 the proof is everywhere. I mean, you, if you go to, you know, anybody who um, is a professor in electronics, for example, and ask them um, what happens in the atmosphere during high voltage discharge, is there some kind of other stuff produced? And I guarantee you, if they know what you're talking about, they're going to say, yeah, there's a lot of ozone that gets produced. You can smell it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's elementary to anybody who understands high voltage physics that ozone is a byproduct of high voltage electrical discharge. You can actually smell ozone, you know, being generated say a Xerox machine, the old Xerox machine. So culture really becomes, I mean, if it's generated, I guess it's generated throughout the atmosphere as it comes from the upper layers down to the ground. Would that be kind of a, a fair assumption? It kind of tapers off as it gets closer to the ground, or is it the, the inverse of that? No, it's, it's mostly up in the upper atmosphere, where the um, higher okay. energy, 
Well, good. Okay, so my question is, how is that going to affect the so-called, you know, hole in the ionosphere, or in the ozone layer, or rather? How, how is that going to affect that? How, how is that going to somehow clog up that hole if it's generated from, from lightning, you know? I how does that work? Is, I believe there is no hole. I think it's just a bunch of crap. <laughs> and if there is a hole, it's not the result of ozone depletion, but rather something else, such as the harp antenna array. And my whole idea about the harp antenna array, which is going on, one of the one of the dozens of uses that is that is being used for, is for. Well, I mean, yeah, they're on record to say it's this thirty mile by thirty mile hole bubble. Uh, I mean, it's like right. the jet stream and whatnot. I mean, yeah, yeah. Every now, it's, it's, a hole can be produced in, in the um, ozone layer, if you will, if they're, they're spraying, um, you know, barium, barium chloride salts, aluminum, uh, you know, aluminum salts and um, beryllium salts in the upper atmosphere, thus changing the dielectric constant and conductivity um, parameters of the atmosphere. And then because... Absolutely. The what would you say about the hologram, you know, holograms. Um, DARPA found out, and we have these documents, I'll definitely have to get them to you, where it's barium, strontium, uh, aluminum oxide, the primary components in the initial chemtrail test results, um, these heavy metals, in a particulate form are the ideal medium in which to propagate holograms into. I yes. find that to be very fascinating because we find that this harp array or you left off, you know, is interfacing with human consciousness also when we change the connectivity of our atmosphere with these particulates or, as you know, interacting with this uh, electromagnetic energy. And it, it's affecting everything, including the, the, the relationship between the energies on this planet and off planet. You know, we obviously would have a relationship with our star, um, as we kind of touched on earlier, and other types of energetic changes that are going on on the galactical level all the way down into our solar system and onto this sphere here. Um, our consciousness is playing on these things. It's a relationship here, how these things are interacting. And um, when we see that somehow there's a holographic manifestation or something going on, isn't it interesting to think that the primary components to propagating holograms in a particular form are what's found in chemtrails? Have you known that? Well, yeah, um, I believe that what's really going on, you know, as far as all that goes, you know, the hologram um, phenomenon, so to speak, in my um, humble opinion, what it all really is, is a diffusion phenomenon that's occurring in the upper atmosphere to where a certain bandwidth of optical radiation, a certain bandwidth of light, are reflected and diffused through Rayleigh scattering and whatnot, rather than just, you know, going straight up and out into space. And because, you know, the um, changes in dielectric constant and changes in atmospheric composition in the upper atmosphere, it acts somewhat like a movie screen for which then a laser projector... Yeah, projector. that's right. But exactly. How does the act of our observation play on that? It's kind of, well, you know, is one... Well, what, they're, um, what I believe they're using is a device called a super continuum laser. And it's a device that um, it's, um, being, it was just recently um, declassified <laughs> and um, some, some uh, company out in Germany made a, a device called a super continuum laser. And what it is, is, is it's a white, white laser. And it's, it's, um, it's not just red, green, and blue to make white. It's pure white. It's, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and everything in between plus a little bit of ultraviolet and infrared also, all at once, all at the same time. Now, if you were to take that type of um, light source and modulate it with um, holographic diffraction grading and, and whatnot, you could literally project a uh, you know, movie screen image on a, on a screen miles and miles across. And the, uh, the entire device could be no, no bigger than, say, um, you know, a couple computer towers. What if we could do that without the use of a laser beam? What if that's what the pineal gland does? I mean, isn't that what a dream is like? Well, in, in, I've come to understand that what a dream is, 
is an alternate reality, an alternate universe, a parallel universe that your soul literally transcends to. Your soul leaves your body in this world and goes to whatever other universes that exist, which there is an infinite amount of them, infinite amount of universes. So everything you could possibly think of and dream of is actually a real place, just not here. I would say I, I like grief. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we would say, pretty much. I have to agree with that because I have lucid dreams often, and it, and I dream in color. I use all my senses. I have I dream a little kid. I understand yeah. that completely. I've had lucid dreams, and I dream in color. But, you know, the past few years, I've been attacked in my dreams by, um, you know, handlers or perps or whatever tormenting me and taunting me and insulting me and causing, you know, nightmarish experiences. And this is all, you know, technologically and or psychically induced. Exactly, yeah. We, you know, when you try to differentiate between an electronic attack or a spiritual attack, it's like you really get into some It's very, difficult. very difficult to discern them, too. Yeah. In terms of, they um, seem to be intertwined nowadays because the people using the technology are also into the occult. They're probably doing both things at the same time. I can sure tell that you've thought about that before. I, I have certainly considered that same conclusion. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's all, all kinds of things that I would love to talk about, but I'm, I'm really tired. <laughs> and, I know, we're I hitting really, a wall here, guys. It's like we're, we're like approaching four and a half hours. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's so much stuff I'd love to talk about and, and do um, bullet points and you know, make cluster diagrams and all kinds of other stuff, you know. But, well, we're not going anywhere. You know, why don't we call it quits, guys, for tonight and, and get back, um, you know, at any time. You know, we're all on Facebook and, you know, we're a phone call away, man. So certainly if something comes up, but I would like to talk to you in the future. Um, I'll get your number from Kim or you can do the same or both or whatever and, you know, I'll probably give you a call. There's probably some stuff we should talk about. I mean, there's probably plenty we can talk about. Yeah, or, or, or message me or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's all good. Yeah, I, mean, it, uh, I had to forego my paranoia about having to hide and, you know, stay hidden and stay off the grid and all that stuff because, I, you know, just come to the realization, just, you know, totally just screw it, you know. I mean, totally watched and harassed and, and targeted and it doesn't matter that what, what I do as far I go. When you step out of that fear bullshit, dude, you are taking authority, man. You are literally hating your fucking environment, brother. I mean, it's that's, profound. That's it's really good. Good. I just, I'm telling you. Um, that's exactly what my, my conclusion is lately. I mean, I'm just, you know, I just want to, you know, instead of, you know, duck and cover, I just want to stand up and look the devil right in the eyes and go, come on, let's go. You want to go? <laughs> you know, let's <laughs> draw, <Sure>. man. <laughs> you know? Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I am basically free tomorrow, guys. So um, get with me on the other stuff that we need to talk about, Kim. And pleasure talking to you, Richard. And look forward to doing that more in the future, just any time. Well, likewise, Eugene. It was very great talking tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll hook up with Facebook, and we can share stuff there and stuff like that too. That's excellent. I'm yeah, you got you guys connected under the um, name of Len. So, yep. um you guys okay. are under under the name of Len. You just I, I put you guys together uh, on that. Um, uh, I thought that you suggested that. So yeah, I've already accepted that. Or I sent a request for that. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. get get into my uh, you know Facebook stuff and check that out. And, you know. Well, hey, much love to you both, and look forward oh to talking. Oh my God. With you. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, that was like a good crazy. one. You know, I think that was. I think we did a great job, and I, I'd be interested to hear some feedback on this one. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> you guys freaking rock, man! Thank God for bringing you into my life. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly, for allowing it. <laughs> <laughs> I and, and hey, for it. a great team, Richard. Just so you know, we have a great team of people who are truly dedicated to getting this work done, and so you're in good company and. You know, we try to keep it on the up and up with people, and, you know, we, and actually we find that if somebody is not meant to work with us, that something 
will tear us apart or, you know, we'll drift apart or whatever the case may be. And it all works yeah. for the best. You know, it all works for the yeah. best. And this gets flushed out. Go the, we all go to the nexus eventually. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, yep. we're, we're, we're collectively on our way there sooner than later. <laughs> I want to I accelerate the process to goodness. You know, and, and, you know uh, if, uh, anything short of, um, you know, using, you know, anti-satellite uh, munitions or anti-satellite lasers, uh, I, I don't know how else to, you know, to deal with it. Other, you know, other than that, at the present time, you know, take them over, broadcast your frequency up into that thing, and use it to broadcast that frequency back down, just like Harp and the rest of this crap does. Just, just go up into it, man, and crawl through those wires and those frequencies, and just broadcast out that energy that's good and wholesome and pure, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, it has a global effect. How about trying to? How about trying to? You know enhance my remote view and try to get into those satellites, you know, and try to, you know, make, you know, two transistors on an H bridge turn on at the same time. Fry the power source. Fry the power supply and just everything goes to shit. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've been wanting to do that for so much. You know, get those, uh, those satellites got to go. There's so many, so many um, malevolent things being done with those satellites. Yeah, we see a lot of that stuff out there. Yeah, have you seen Mind Control, yo? You might want to hook up with him on Facebook. He's got a whole ad campaign about anti-satellite terrorism, and he's really doing a great job. He's a smart guy. He's got a lot of yeah, stuff I've, going on. I've been, uh, you know, we've been um, chatting, too. <laughs> so. Absolutely. All right. Well. All right, guys. Wow. Well, hey, interview. Right. Talk soon. And um, I guess we're finished, huh? I'm um, yeah, not really. Oh, we're just scratched the surface tonight. It's only right. four and a half hours. We're scratched the surface tonight. <laughs> but I love you guys. You know, you're awesome. And um, we'll put well, this out there. Well, it's good to have the Yep. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that makes me feel better. And I've got a good day planned tomorrow. And can't wait to just continue doing this stuff. I'm really excited about all the stuff we have coming up with Call to Actions in the next few weeks and the following months into the summer and stuff because I'm telling you what, we're gearing up for it and we're really going after these guys to, to just make a change in our environment. We're not going after anybody in particular. We just want yeah. to see some change, if you know. So I hear that. That's what it's about um, taking uh, our free will into our own hands and uh, manifesting a positive pi timeline, and that's where we're going with it. And if that's how we have to finish with this conversation, that's a great upward way to continue the conversation moving forward. Anything mm -hmm. else you guys want to say? Yeah. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, well, then, I think that's both, and so yeah, we'll be looking forward to getting this edited and and put out there, and, and I'll do some editing on it, and we'll put it out there in its entirety, and many more to come, I'm sure, so. Sounds excellent. Yeah. Yeah, no editing needed. We'll just, um, we just got to chop up the sections of the areas that we can focus on expanding upon, because we have so much to talk about. Um, yeah, I'm really so important to put it out there for people. I just... I might want to do like a little segment for somebody that we really nailed some stuff to try to get that idea across or something like that. You know, just trying to get the information out in different ways and stuff like that. But yeah, most people can't listen to a broadcast of four and a half hours. If I turn this on, I would not turn it off. I would have dragged my friends in. I would have gone and got my neighbors and be like, dude, turn it on this channel. <laughs> That's really, that was not good, huh? I think so. I think it just blows the stuff that I've heard on, you know, all these other outlets pretty much away. Um, I think it's pretty much beyond cutting edge of the things that we're talking about here tonight. And um, I don't sound say that to be haughty. I think that there's a lot of other brilliant people out there who are doing very similar work and research, and that's why it's so important to come together, simply. That's right. So, yeah. 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 Watch this um, entire TI mind control shit. Yeah. Yeah, watch it Done. fall apart right in front of our eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. 
Yeah. Well, let's let, let's let's end this on a high note of just brotherly, sisterly, collaborative love, and um, let's continue this conversation. And we'll we'll break it down. We won't go on for a day. We'll we'll break it down into segments that are um, more focused on a I don't know, guys. You throw it out there. ELF. Uh, mind control, it, it, it's like there's so many facets of what we talked about tonight, but we're all tired and we're going to bed. And we can um, be very grateful for that we are brought, brought together literally yesterday, Eugene yeah. and I, like a year and a half ago, and literally yesterday. And now wow. we're having this conversation. So no grateful. Yes, yeah, awesome. none. <laughs> Beautiful synchronicity. Thank you. Synchronicity. Divine synchronicity. synchronicity. Yes. <laughs> All right. And, and and you, my brother, are close to home, so we will we will meet in person soon because you're in LA and I'm in Huntington Beach. And All right. um, I would I would like to meet in person soon. Likewise. Cool. Yeah. cool. Uh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I love to talk soon. Um, and let's gear up. You know, let's get it out there. Get get the information out. Let's do it. All right. Put it out there for everybody. And I'm looking forward to yes. what, what the feedback can be offered because we can expand on everything for sure. Oh, absolutely. We're just cool. scratching the surface, kiddos. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. We'll, um, Kim, you're going to go ahead and put this up in its entirety, and then we'll chop it up after that, or. Um, we'll put it up in its entirety. Um, I have to, I'm not going to do it tonight. Um, okay, I'll yeah. probably attempt to do it tomorrow because this is new in my zone as far as moving um, a radio or a radio to a video kind of thing. So. Yeah, you can anyway. do it. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely make sure we get you a copy, Richard, and um, you can do whatever you want with it as far as I'm concerned. There's a, you know, it's, part, it's yours, as much yours as it is ours. We don't want to own Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a collaborative right. thing. Nobody owns anything here. <laughs> That's right. Good efforts rock. <laughs> That's right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, All right, kiddos. Okay, oh, hey, right. Richard. Look forward to talking real soon, bud. Hey, likewise. Oh, yeah. You take care, man. All right, you too. Thank you. Thank you. You guys rock. Bye-bye, Kim. Good night. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you guys. Right. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>